Hey, good morning. Welcome to the September 22nd, 2020 public hearing, public meeting of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. I will call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Commissioner Bland. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. <coughs> Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Okay, we're all set. Okay, thank you. And welcome everyone to the Landmarks Preservation Commission September 22nd public hearing and public meeting. Today we will be um, starting with a public meeting item on a proposed designation, and then we will be moving to a public hearing for another proposed designation. And those will be followed by a public meeting item uh, for an application for work on designated properties, which has already had a public hearing, but was read into the record. So we will be taking testimony on that public meeting item and then our regular public hearing agenda uh, for applications on work on designated properties. And this meeting is being held via Zoom and live streamed on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested in just watching, you should do that on our YouTube channel at our homepage on YouTube. And if you're interested in participating in any of the hearing items, you can join the meeting at the time that is estimated on our public hearing agenda. And we will uh, provide the links with each item as we present them. Okay, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kate Lemos McHale, our Director of Research, to start her agenda. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Um, the first item this morning on the research agenda is LP 2646, Public School 48, now PS 75Q at PS 48, the Robert E. Peary School. 155 02 108th Avenue, AKA 155 02 to 156 00 108th Avenue, 108 01 to 108-03, 155th Street, Borough of Queens, Block 10144, Lot 42. The item proposed for designation is the Art Deco style school building designed by Walter C. Martin, first proposed in 1931 and constructed in 1932 to 36. Okay. Are you seeing the first slide now? Yes. First proposed in 1931 and completed in 1936, the Art Deco style Public School 48 in Jamaica represents an extensive construction program undertaken by the New York City Board of Education to relieve overcrowding in existing school districts and to meet the needs of new growing residential neighborhoods after World War I. It is a notable design by its architect, Walter C. Martin, and an early use of the Art Deco style for elementary school buildings, demonstrating innovations in school planning and a stylistic shift away from the more traditional revival styles commonly used in the early 20th century and into the 1940s. At the public hearing on August 4th, 2020, the commission received support for the proposed designation uh, of Public School 48 from four people, including Council Member Adrian Adams and representatives from the New York Landmarks Conservancy, Historic Districts Council, and the Art Deco Society of New York. No one spoke in opposition. In addition, the agency received one letter of support. Public School 48 is located at the southeast corner of 108th Avenue and 155th Street in South Jamaica, Queens, as shown here. Jamaica, one of the five towns that made up Queens County prior to 1898, was a vital link between the farms of Long Island and the markets of New York. The downtown developed throughout the 18th and 19th centuries as a result of improved roads and public transportation. However, the area known as South Jamaica remained largely rural farmland until the 20th century, as shown in these maps from 1891 and 1907 and residential development remained scattered into the 1920s. The blue star marks the approximate location of Public School 48. Plans for a single citywide school system began prior to New York City's consolidation 
and a reorganized Board of Education was established in 1901 to administer the system. Prior, the prior year, the state legislature had amended the cons consolidated school law governing the city schools, abolishing separate segregated schools for African-American children. By 1901, PS 48 was established in a one-story wood schoolhouse, which had been built in 1886 as Jamaica's, quote, colored school. This schoolhouse is shown in the image on the right and outlined in black on the map. PS 48 was housed there until the new school was completed in 1936 in the location shown on the map with a blue star. The neighborhood's population grew in the 20th century as the former farmland of South Jamaica was developed and a diverse working class neighborhood grew around the area that would be chosen for the new school. Efforts to replace the old schoolhouse had begun as early as 1905 but it was not until 1931 that plans to build the new public school 48 at 108th Avenue and 155th Street were first announced. The following year, it was reported that the new school would be the first to be built along the P-type plan, incorporating an extended auditorium wing with space for more classrooms as shown in the rendering above. Superintendent of Buildings, Walter C. Martin, had originally developed his P-type plan in 1930, but it appears to have been put aside until its use for the Jamaica School at PS 48. Walter C. Martin served as superintendent of buildings for the Board of Education from 1928 until 1938, during which time he designed hundreds of new schools or additions to existing schools throughout the five boroughs, including 34 new elementary schools and five high schools in Queens alone. The Herman Ritter Junior High School in the Bronx, shown here, is perhaps his most notable building, built in 1929 to 31 and a New York City landmark. Martin's school designs were executed in a variety of styles, from Renaissance Revival to Colonial Revival to Art Deco, displaying the range of stylistic approaches to school design in the interwar period. Martin used the modernistic or Art Deco style for some large projects, such as Herman Ritter, and adapted it for smaller elementary schools like Public School 48, where his use of the style created modern civic monuments for growing communities. <clears throat> Constructed between 1932 and 36, Martin's design for the three-story Public School 48 indeed imparts a sense of monumentality appropriate to a civic structure, anchored with strong corner towers and featuring vertical piers with stylized foliate capitals creating the impression of a crenellated parapet. His use of the Art Deco style drew inspiration from industrial and commercial buildings, reflected in its large window openings, originally with awning windows as seen in the 1940 tax photo, and incorporated distinctive decorative treatment not seen in some of his other schools in the style. Drawing upon the decorative palette used in his design for Ritter Junior High School, Martin highlighted the main facade with bicolor brick spandrels, bicolor terracotta plaques evocative of the importance of education, stylized foliate plaques atop the piers, and granite entrance surrounds featuring stylized eagles that, honor, that harbor bronze doors with bronze and framed multi-light transoms. These highly distinctive decorative features set PS48 apart from other schools in the period and style. In lieu of carving the name of the school on the facade, Martin applied stylized cartouches with the school's numerical designation, balancing them with the New York City and Board of Education seals just above the base of the towers. Prominent within the neighborhood of South Jamaica, Queens, Public School 48 has served its community for more than 70 years. Little change since its opening on May 4th, 1936, it is a highly intact example of Walter C. Martin's use of the Art Deco style in the 1930s. Its successful blend of Art Deco design elements and massing was novel for elementary schools at the time it was proposed, and it represents a significant early application of the style for New York City schools. The research staff and Mary Ann Percival did the research here and wrote the report, uh, recommends that the commission designate Public School 48, now Public School 75Q at PS 48, the Robert E. Peary School, as a New York City landmark. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Commissioners, do we have any questions? 
for Kate or Marianne? No, or any thoughts? Sir, I raised my hand. Sir, you have a hand raised. Okay, I see. Go ahead, Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, the the um, in, in case I missed it, I don't I don't think I did. The the operation of the windows, notwithstanding, the multi light uh, windows on this are are really kind of awkward and strange. Is there some way that we can mention in the designation? that these windows are replacements and they don't match the original so that in the future when someone comes and they and they say, well, it's already got divided lights, uh, we don't have to, to follow a precedent because it wasn't mentioned in the designation report. Yes, absolutely. We mentioned that they're replacements and um... We can describe what the original windows were that were replaced. We also include a tax photo in the report, so that's there for reference. Yeah, but you know, in in the past, people have said, "Well, it's not listed in the designation report as their evidence for not doing something or doing something." Okay, thanks. Just sure. want to be sure. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Chapin. I just want to comment that I'm very happy to see this designation. Uh, I think it's a, a very fine building uh, and uh, just uh, kind of a lovely example of, and the ornamentation, uh, everything about it is a really nice example of a public school and uh, a, a good addition to landmarks in Queens and uh, in this community especially. So I'm very pleased to see it. Thank you. Any other thoughts? All right, well, like Diana, I'm also a Queens resident and a representative from Queens. And so I'm really delighted that we're at this point in the process today. Um, PS48, as we heard in the presentation, is unique as one of the first elementary schools in New York City to incorporate the Art Deco style. And if designated, would only be the second Art Deco style building in New York City to be a landmark. And that design represents the modernization of school design in the 1930s and the ideal of creating monumental civic structures to serve neighborhood children. Um, the sp school also speaks to overcoming challenges originally established to provide equal access to public ed education after New York City schools were integrated at the turn of the 20th century and constructed during the depression with funds from the Public Works Administration. And um, also I wanna note that if designated, this would be the first landmark in South Jamaica. Uh, so we're, you know, we have, I think this, in many ways merits on many levels and I'm also delighted it's here. So with that, I think I'd love to move this to a vote. Diana, would you make the, ch uh, the motion? And we'll take a vote. Yes, I, thank you. I make a motion to designate public school uh, 48. Do you have the, the, act the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, now PS uh, 75Q at PS 48 the Robert E. Perry School. I move that the Landmarks Preservation Commission designate public school 48, now PS 75Q at PS 48, the Robert E. Perry School, 15502 108th Avenue, AKA 155-02, 156-00, 108th Avenue, 108-01, 105th Street, Borough of Queens is a New York City landmark because of its special character and special historical and aesthetic interest and value as part of the development, heritage, and cultural characteristics of the city, state, and nation. As set forth in the designation re report for LP 2646, dated September 22nd, 2020. I also move that the Borough of Queens tax map lot 10144, lot 42, be designated as its landmark site. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire, would you second that motion? I second that motion. Thank you. Rich, will you call the vote? Yes. Chair Carroll. Aye. 
Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Commissioner Devonshire, you're on mute. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Rich, nine, yes. Rich, Rich, I've joined the meeting, so. Oh, thank you, Commissioner Bland. Commissioner Bland. That's an aye for me too. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, unless I miss any other votes, the motion carries. All right, great. So this is our latest New York City landmark, our second Art Deco style school building to be designated and the first landmark in South Jamaica. And I wanna thank Adrian Adams, the chair of the landmark subcommittee of the city council who asked us to look at this building, which is in her district. And that led us to do a school study and a comparative analysis of designated and undesignated schools. And um, I think that study is gonna be very informative for us going forward. I also wanna thank the Department of Education and School Construction Authority for supporting our efforts as we conducted our research. And I also wanna note that this is the first designation that we've taken through the whole process from calendaring to designation while working remotely. So, you know, we were able to complete some items that had started while we were in person remotely, um, but this is the first one that we have, has gone through the entire process. And, um, you know, I have to say that the research staff has done an incredible job with all of the work that they're doing and with, uh, you know, access limited to certain resources. And I wanna say that I'm very proud of the staff and Kate, the team, Marianne Percival, who did the research on this item um, and all of their efforts to complete the designation. So uh, designation report so thoroughly. So thank you to the team. Sarah, can I say yes. something? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I also want to, um, um, of course, uh, add my congratulations to our staff for this uh, heroic effort in our new era of <laughs> swimming uh, and remote working. It's occurred to me that, and I don't know if this is possible within our um, constraints, uh, but it occurred to me that um, it might be interesting, presumably this school will be back in operation uh, soon, uh, if not exactly right now. Uh, and I just thought it might be interesting if you could work out something with the principal and some teachers to actually go to the school somehow or other in some form and actually let the kids know that their school has just been named a landmark in the last few weeks, let's say, and what that means and why it's a landmark and That's point out the reasons and so forth. You know, the earlier we get uh, kids uh, hooked on the idea of preservation and conservation of their city, uh, the better it is for people like us who believe so um, strongly in preserving um, historic buildings. So just that's, a thought. It's a wonderful thought, Fred. Thank you. And I think that you know, we'll work hard to try to do that. I think that's an excellent idea, a great way for students coming back into school to feel very excited and proud. And as you say, to start to bring the sort of <laughs> preservation spirit up along starting in the elementary school. So right. good. thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move to the next item, Kate. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, the first item on the research department's public hearing agenda is LP 2647, East 25th Street Historic District uh, in Brooklyn. And the proposed district has boundaries described in the agenda and in the following presentation. Uh, good morning, commissioners. <laughs> The proposed historic district is a remarkably cohesive group of 56 row houses built by a single developer, the Henry Meyer Building Company, between 1909 and 1912. All were built in the Renaissance Revival style and remain well preserved. The proposed historic district extends along both sides of East 25th Street between Clarendon Road and Avenue D in Brooklyn's Flatbush neighborhood. In determining the boundaries of the proposed district, staff analyzed a broader area and co 
concluded that this block stands out within its larger neighborhood context for its consistency and high level of historic integrity. Although its developer, Henry Meyer, also built row houses adjacent to the proposed district facing East 26th Street, those houses are of a different style and considerably less intact. This section of East 25th Street largely retains its character of a century ago. As shown on these maps, the proposed historic district owes its exceptional cohesiveness and strong sense of place to three major factors. Its construction within a very short time frame by a single developer, its architectural consistency entirely in the Renaissance Revival style, and its excellent historic integrity. All 56 houses in the proposed historic district remain well preserved. Flatbush was initially its own town, developing separately from the city of Brooklyn until its annexation by Brooklyn in 1894. Although the Brooklyn, Flatbush, and Coney Island Railroad linked the neighborhood with downtown Brooklyn in 1878, Flatbush remained largely rural until the 1890s. This map shows the location of the proposed historic district in 1873 on what was still the Vanderveer Farm in southeastern Flatbush. It also shows the new Prospect Park to its north and west, which would be the focus of the neighborhood's earliest residential development. Residential development in Flatbush was originally focused in the areas directly east and south of Prospect Park in the late 19th century, which were also convenient to the Brooklyn and Brighton Beach Railroad. Important early developments included sections of the Prospect Lefferts Gardens Historic District east of the park, the Prospect Park South Historic District with its opulent freestanding houses, and the suburban developments farther south, including Ditmas Park, Fisk Terrace, and Midwood Park, all designated historic districts be begun by the early 20th century. While other areas of Flatbush were developed by 1905, the area around the proposed district, shown here in red, remained semi-rural at that time, consisting mostly of wood-framed buildings scattered along an incomplete st street grid. But within a few years, new transportation routes to and through the neighborhood spurred intensive development in the vicinity of East 25th Street. Major transportation improvements included the Nostrand Avenue streetcar line, five blocks east of the proposed district, which crossed the new Williamsburg Bridge in 1906 and linked Flatbush with Manhattan's Lower East Side. West of the proposed district, a substantial upgrade and expansion of the Brighton Railroad in 1908 brought it essentially to its present form as the city's B and Q subway lines and was heralded as, quote, one of the great transportation highways of the metropolitan district, unquote. The Henry Meyer Building Company purchased the site of the proposed district in the spring of 1909. This property was part of the former farm outlined in blue here on the map, established by Cornelius Jans Vanderveer soon after leaving Holland in 1659. In 1790, it belonged to his grandson, also named Cornelius, whose household consisted of five white males, five white females, and 10 enslaved people whose genders were not recorded. The farm was known to generations of Flatbush residents for its windmill, shown here, that reputedly sheltered African Americans seeking refuge during the 1863 draft riots. The windmill was destroyed in a fire in 1879, and by the 1890s, Vanderveer descendants began selling portions of the farm. Developer Henry Meyer was born in Germany around 1864 and immigrated to the United States while still in his teens. Starting in the 1890s, his firm constructed approximately 700 houses in the Cypress Hill section of Brooklyn's East New York neighborhood, illustrated on the left. Possibly due to Meyer's membership in the Cortelyou Club near East 25th Street, Meyer ventured into the Flatbush Market and the earliest houses on the East 25th Street were completed by the end of 1909. In a December 1909 advertisement, Meyer claimed, quote, we transformed East New York from a wilderness to a city. We are now operating in Flatbush and are going to duplicate our former success." Unquote. Meyer's ads highlighted the area's excellent transit facilities, clubs and schools, easy access to Brighton Beach and Coney Island, and the privacy that only a single family house could offer. 
Modern features included parquet floors, up-to-date plumbing, laundry facilities, gas and electric fixtures, and oak and birch trim from the company's own mill. Myers East 25th Street houses were executed in the Renaissance Revival style, featuring limestone or brownstone fronts, full height rounded or angled projecting bays, foliated keystones, and classically ornamented entrance surrounds and cornices. The two sides of East 25th Street are mirror images of each other. Unlike similar houses constructed elsewhere in Brooklyn at that time, which were constructed as more affordable two-family homes, these were built as single family houses, reflecting Flatbush's affluent reputation. Although about a dozen of the houses are known to have been constructed with rooftop balustrades, they do not appear to have been built consistently across the block. Most houses did not have them at the time of the circa 1940 tax photos, and the balustrades themselves were not of uniform design. One house, 360 East 25th Street, retains its original balustrade today and is shown here. Um, following an economic downturn coinciding with their completion, many of the houses languished on the market. In 1912, the unsold homes were acquired by another Brooklyn developer, Realty Associates, which subsequently sold them off. They were built too good to sell in the present slow times, Brooklyn Life reported. And rather than retail them at lower prices, Henry Meyer decided to sell them in bulk and get out of the building business for the present. This map from shortly after the proposed district was built gives a sense of its remarkable cohesiveness, which stands out in the surrounding area. This area is a regular grid with short and angled streets and history of primarily small scale development contributed to a diverse array of building types in both masonry and wood. Buildings tended to be built individually or in small groups, making the long unbroken rows of East 25th Street especially distinctive. During their early years, these houses were owned and occupied by the families of white merchants or other upper middle, upper middle class professionals. In recent decades, their ownership has come to reflect Flatbush's increasing diversity and the growth of its African-American and Caribbean American communities. Since 2004, this section of East 25th Street has won the Brooklyn Botanic Garden's Greenest Block in Brooklyn contest four times and earned several second and third place finishes and window box awards. The pride of the street's homeowners in their houses and street is evident, not only in the lush greenery of their front yards, but in the proposed district's outstanding historic integrity. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Commissioners, do we have any questions before we move to testimony? All right, I don't see any hands, so I think we will now move to testimony. Um, if you are in the meeting and you wish to testify, please raise your hand so we can identify you. We will start with people who signed up in advance, and then we will move to everyone else. So um, just as long as you have your hand up, we will get to you. So, and I'm gonna turn it over to our executive director, Lisa Krasavich, to manage the testimony. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, and I'm gonna start by calling Rachel Goodfriend, followed by Julia Charles, and then followed by Carol Renault. Um, so I'll bring you into the room and you just need to um, unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Please make sure to state your name for the record. Um, and everybody has three minutes to speak, please. So Rachel. Thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Goodfriend and I am the co-chair of the Land Use Committee of Brooklyn Community Board 17. Um, the Land Use Committee applauds the East 25th Street Historic District Initiative for their hard work and dedication towards preserving their significant block. The Land Use Committee voted to support the Historic District on February 6th of this year on February 19th of this year, the members of the Community Board 17 unanim unanimously voted to support a historic district on East 25th Street between Clarendon Road and Avenue D. The Land Use Committee honors the East 25th Street Historic District Initiative's efforts as part of our holistic approach to preserve and protect the culture of East Flatbush, where we have some of the highest rates of home ownership by Black New Yorkers. The Land Use Committee is thrilled to support a historic district that helps our overall goal 
of contextualizing the built environment of Community Board 17 and honors the culture of the community. We hope that the Landmarks Preservation Commission recognizes the meaningful community support and approves the East 25th Street Historic District. Further, it's our sincere hope that the East 25th Street Initiative becomes a catalyst for future historic districts and communities of color throughout New York City. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rachel. Okay, Julia Charles, we bring you in as a panelist. And Julia, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Oops, we may have lost Julia for a moment. Um, Julia, I don't see you right now, so I think we're going to skip you and we can come back to you. And I'm going to call the next person, which is Carol Renault. So Carol, um, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm, uh, can you hear me? I'm just making sure I'm in a car. <laughs> yes. If you could just state your name for the record too, please. Yes, I'm Carol Renault, co-president of the 300 East 25th Street Block Association with a personalized testimony. First of all, I'd like to thank the Historic District Council and the Landmark Preservation Commission for their time, guidance, and diligence as, uh, that they have shown towards our cause. To our neighbors and community, thank you for your support and for being great stewards. In 1997, when our family was searching for our first home, we viewed over 25 before settling on 319 East 25th Street. What initially appealed to us was that this block was different than the surrounding neighborhood. We were transformed by the neat row of homes, the style structure of the buildings, the high windows, the wide doors, a stoop to sit and relax, a place to garden, and the aesthetically appealing site that existed on a block within walking distance of a top tier CUNY school, Brooklyn College. Upon viewing the interior, the detailed woodworking, fireplace, skylights, column, column and superior craftsmanship won our hearts. The previous owner had lived in this home for 32 years and her exemplary stewardship of the building was evident. She had many offers to purchase, but entrusted our family to carry on the stewardship in like manner. We have lived up to our agreement and have done everything in our control to ensure that this property will remain intact for future families. I'm appealing to the Landmarks Preservation Commission to partner with us and further strengthen our endeavor. As a New York Public School global history teacher, I get to reinforce the importance of building on and learning from the past with my students on a daily basis in our classrooms. On field trips, we've had the opportunity of traveling through numerous New York neighborhoods. These interactions have given us a firmer understanding of who uh, were here before us and how these neighborhoods relay their stories through its buildings. These buildings have provided great detail and given us a firmer grasp of New York and its diverse culture. I cannot imagine what historical story would exist in Kensington without the Victor Victorian homes, in Sunset Park without the Row homes, and in Brooklyn Heights without its Greek revival architectural style, and now in Flatbush without these limestones and brownstones. Lastly, as an avid traveler, fortunate to have traveled to over 34 countries, my appreciation of history and preservation remains at the forefront. When we plan our family vacations, we generally go off the beaten path to truly connect with the cultures that currently exist. Lasting connections are often made through visits to the existing buildings and historic homes. The, the historic Hutan district in Beijing, China and well-preserved Morocco are two such places that connected 
the past and present for us. In the same manner, when future generations and visitors embark upon East 25th Street and see what I saw in 1997, they too will be able to enjoy the historical, cultural, and even environmental benefits of these architecturally sound homes. We thank you once again, and we hope that this section of Flatbush will be preserved. Okay, thank you. Um, Julia, I see that you're back, so I'm gonna try and bring you in. I'm gonna promote you to a panelist. And you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. It's good. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I had <laughs> technical difficulties this morning. Um, okay. Can everyone hear me? I'm just making sure. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Good morning. Uh, my name is Julia Charles. I'm the founder and lead for the East 25th Street Historic District Initiative. I reside at 336 East 25th Street in Flatbush, Brooklyn. It is my honor to provide a live testimony today in support of the proposed East 25th Street Historic District. My family and I moved on to East 25th Street August 2013 after being displaced by Hurricane Sandy. Immediately upon entering the block, we knew we came to a magical place that will be our forever home. The foundation of New York City's iconic brownstones and limestones developed by Henry Meyer Company, almost pale in comparison to the lush streetscape gardens admired by all that visit, especially during the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens Venus Block in Brooklyn competition. It is no surprise that the homes here on this block are so carefully intact. The residents here have nurtured and cared for their homes, even during the most challenging times in New York City. They are model stewards of our Flatbush community. However, rapid and overdevelopment has affected our community tremendously. Our sister block of East 26th Street has recently endured a full demolition of a row house. The residents of East 25th Street, past, present, have nurtured their century old framed a century old homes framed by prize winning gardens with tremendous care. It is only befitting that our city honors its rich cultural and architectural history by designating our block as the 151st historic district. I just like to thank um, the commissioners for your time, the research team, Chair Carroll for working with our community led campaign Thank you to our community partners, the Historic District Council, especially Kelly Carroll for your guidance and advocacy. Council member Farrah Lewis, assembly member Rodney Spichot, the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens, Nina Brown, community board 17 land use committee, and most of all my neighbors, without you, none of this would actually be possible. Thank you. You're muted, Lisa. Sorry, sorry. Um, Kelly Carroll uh, will be followed by Andrea Goldwyn and then um, Phoebe Blake, I have you signed up if you want to speak. Maybe you could raise your hand. So Good Kelly, morning. We're all set for you. Good morning, Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. This year, HDC selected East Flatbush as one of our six to celebrate neighborhoods with a special emphasis on the block of East 25th Street between Clarendon Road and Avenue D. We are proud to work with this special block from the first phone call to our office to its LPC public hearing today. Owners and residents of the row houses of East 25th Street take pride in preserving their block and creating beauty. The result, an intact early 20th century streetscape with exceptional gardens this block's demonstrated stewardship has won the Brooklyn Botanic Gardens annual contest as the greenest block in Brooklyn a whopping four times. Deeper than usual gardens sit in front of intact brownstone and limestone row houses 
all of which retain their original cornices, carved keystones and door surrounds, and many retain iron stoop railings and doors. The proposed district comprises 56 houses that face East 25th Street. The block was developed by beginning of May 1909 by the Henry Meyer Building Company. Henry Meyer also owned the Germania Real Estate Company and the Jamaica Bay Improvement Association and developed much of the Flatbush neighborhood by the turn of the 20th century by selling the parcels of what would become Van Dever Park and the New York City designated Fisk Terrace Midwood Park Historic District. While Germania didn't build homes, the Henry Meyer Building Company created approximately 1,000 homes in Brooklyn between 1894 and 1909, with construction concentrated in Cypress Hills in East New York. East 25th Street was among the company's first and largest foray in development in the Flatbush, Flatbush section of Brooklyn. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle described the block's development as one family houses of a high grade to sell from seven to eight thousand dollars. We shall fill up both sides of East 25th Street between Clarendon Road and Avenue D. All are two story structures, some with limestone and the others with brownstone fronts. They will be finished in hard wood with parquet floors, tiled kitchens, shower baths, and electric lights. We have our own molding mill on Force Tube Avenue in East New York to prepare all our own trim for our houses and experience in building to see that good work goes into them. The Eagle further reported that no other region in Brooklyn showed this level of growth at the time and that the Flatbush territory was rapidly filling up with homes. These homes are representative of transit and infrastructure improvements in Flatbush by a speculative developer, as Meyer also graded and paved all of the streets, installed curbs and sidewalks, and laid the sewer, water, and gas lines for both East 25th and East 26th streets. This development is demonstrative of Flatbush's rapid transition from a suburban location characterized by detached large houses to the densely built row house blocks that arrived in the years after the city's consolidation. Further, there are no row house blocks in Flatbush that are protected as New York City historic districts, and this block is certainly a standout in terms of its integrity, resident support, and beauty. We urge the to schedule a vote as soon as possible to designate the first landmarks in East Flatbush since 1965, when the Wyckoff House, New York City's first landmark, was designated. And I also want to personally thank Julia Charles for all of her incredible organizing and hard work um, from everything from making the pins to organizing neighbors to creating outreach during the pandemic. It was truly an honor to work with her and I thank everyone who had a hand in it today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, Andrea Goldwyn. Hey, uh, good morning, Chair Carroll and commissioners. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is so pleased to join residents and advocates to support designation of the East 25th Street Historic District in Flatbush. This handsome block of row houses well represents the architecture and history of Brooklyn in the early 20th century. Transportation improvements and the completion of Prospect Park led to residential development in the neighborhoods closest to the park at the turn of the century, while expansion of the transit system and success of that first wave of development encouraged more building in the Flatbush section and transformed areas such as East 25th Street from semi-rural to a dense urban community by 1912. The 56 low-scale houses are notable for intact limestone and brownstone Renaissance Revival style facades. They maintain their historic form, scale, materials and decorative details. The series of deeply set back front areaways are exceptionally well maintained and often glorious. Those gardens have been recognized and celebrated as the best of Brooklyn several times. Overall, the block exhibits a strong sense of place that merits designation. This area of Brooklyn is facing growing development pressures. We thank the commission for bringing this designation forward urge a swift vote and hope that the other distinctive residential other excuse me that other distinctive residential blocks in Flatbush will soon be heard. The Conservancy is also happy to offer building owners assistance from our technical services and historic properties fund programs. Thank you for the opportunity to express the Conservancy's views. Okay, thank you, Andrea. 
Um, Phoebe Blake um, signed up to speak. All right, I'm going to bring you in. And you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose. Okay, Phoebe, I just have to accept being unmuted. There you go. On the camera. And I think you might have you sound playing in the background, but. One second. Okay. All right. One second. One, sorry about that. Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so my name is Phoebe Blake. Um, I'm the former president of the 300 East 25th Street Block Association. Um, we've lived in this house um, on this block since 1997 when our daughter was uh, just three years old. She's now 26. We actually were kicked out of our apartment because she was an, a noisy kid. Um, so this block, uh, my husband found it um, one day while just driving through Flatbush and he actually brought me over to see the block. He said, you wouldn't believe this block. It's just beautiful and I, I couldn't believe it. So this was the first house that we saw in our house search. Um, of course, he was said that we couldn't get the first house um, because it had no parking, but I really fell in love with the house. Um, we loved the built-in cabinets, the stained glass skylights, the bay windows, the window seats in the bedroom, the pocket doors, the fireplace, the triple parlors, the inlaid floors, but most of all, we loved the vibe and the warmth of the house and the block. Um, from the time we moved here, I became involved in a block association, um, first as a secretary um, and then vice president and president. Uh, it probably was like a maybe 18 year span I've been involved in a block um, and in maintaining the block. We've won the greenest block in Brooklyn several times. Um, the most important aspect of the, of the block and the um, is the people that live here. Um, some of the warmest, most wonderful people. And I think uh, what threatens us most is the development. Um, I think uh, being designated uh, as a historic a landmark uh, would protect us from the developers and uh, keep our way of life, our diversity, intact. And I think um, I appreciate all the work that Julia has done in the landmarking committee. And I would really like to see this beautiful block and these beautiful people designated as a historic district in Flatbush. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Phoebe. Okay, I see one more hand raised, uh, Maddie Smith. I'm going to promote you to a panelist. And you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your camera if you choose, and then please state your name for the record. Hi. My name is Hi, Maddie Smith. we can Smith. hear you. Hi. Uh, my name is Maddie <laughs> Smith. Um, my wife, Koru Kumatani, and I are homeowners um, at residence at 349 East 25th Street. Um, we have two daughters that we are raising in this house and on the block. And uh, we have both lived in Brooklyn for almost 20 years. This is our first home. We intend for it to be our last. Um, we found this block uh, when we were living nearby in a neighboring neighborhood, uh, taking our daughters for a walk in their stroller and fell in love with it immediately and took walks down this block for the next six months, uh, waiting and hoping that there might be a for sale sign in a window, which there was. We moved here in July of 2017 and we have been 
completely welcomed by the neighborhood and the community. We fell in love with the block because of its architectural integrity and history. Um, but we love the block now because of the community and our neighbors and their support. And the reason we have such a strong community and the reason we have such a strong neighborhood is because of the architectural history um, of this block. And we're, we're going to raise our children here. We're gonna raise our daughters here. And we wanna preserve this for future families um, to raise their children uh, here as well and to keep the community uh, going and growing. And um, uh, I just wanna, the, the last thing I wanna say is just that um, preserving uh, our history is an investment in our future. And um, I just wanna thank uh, Julia Charles and Ms. Renault for making this happen and all their hard and tireless work and everyone who's been involved to um, get us to this point. Thank you. You're muted, Lisa. I'm sorry. Uh, we have one last name. I apologize for that. Shelly, I have brought you in. Um, Shelly Worrell, you just need to unmute yourself, which you've done, and turn on your camera if you choose. Please just state your name for the record. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so my name is Shelly Worrell. I'm also a resident of the 300 East 25th Street um, proposed historic district. And I just wanted to speak on behalf of Caribbean, and I'm also the person who spearheaded the designation of Little Caribbean and NYC, and our block is home to a number of Caribbean immigrants. Um, and we also live in a very large and diverse Caribbean community. And as we mentioned uh, previously on the panel, uh, a lot of them are homeowners. And also as a homeowner, first generation of Caribbean descent, that's a Flatbush native. I just wanted to lend my personal support as a homeowner on this block, as well as my uh, organizational support to this designation. Sorry about that, that was not for you. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, okay. I don't see any other hands raised. All right, great. And Rich, do you, have we at this point received any written testimony that we haven't heard uh, about today through speakers? Uh, we have received a total of 26 letters in support, a handful of them by uh, today's speakers. Um, but not including uh, letters of support from Council Member Lewis, Assembly Member Bichette, in addition to the Community Board's letter of support. Thank you. Thank you. All right, commissioners, any uh, thoughts or questions? Okay. Well, I wanna thank everyone for their participation today. I, the, it, you know, it's been incredible working with the community on East 25th Street. And, and I wanna thank Julia Charles in particular for uh, reaching out to me and starting the relationship. I'd like to thank Historic Districts Council for giving them the guidance um, and and facilitating that interaction, and you know the I think it's just it was very moving listening to the testimony today. It, it's clear how um, this block has a sense of place that attracted people, and that the community has been incredible stewards and have a, a shared love of this block. And so, I found this testimony to be very moving. Commissioner Gustafson, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to uh, second or follow up on what you just said about the, the, um, the community. Um, the testimony that, that we heard today was, um, you know, incredibly, um, you know, uh, positive and, and, and articulate. And it's given to us by people who clearly care a lot about um, exactly the kinds of things that, uh, that make um, historic districts valuable to um, to diverse communities in, in the city. And so um, I, I was just thrilled to hear um, all of it. And, uh, and I thank people for spending their time, um, you know, contributing that um, information to us and enabling us to make a good decision. So thank you. Great, thank you. I think it's a real example about how preservation of historic fabric and communities are so intertwined. Um, so today we will, um, close the hearing.
and we will bring this back for a vote in the very near future. So Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Uh, so moved. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? I second that motion. Okay, and I'm just unmuting everybody. And in some cases you have to accept that request so we can uh, have a vote on closing the hearing. Okay. Everybody in favor of closing the hearing today, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. The hearing is closed. We will um, continue to accept any written testimony that, that is submitted up until the time that we schedule the vote. And we will schedule that vote in the near future and we'll let everybody know. Thank you all. And we will now move to the Preservation Department agenda. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, the first item on the preservation agenda is a public meeting item. It was actually read into the record on September 15th, so you haven't heard it yet. This is the first time you'll be seeing it. And it's an application um, docket number 21-01179, 201 Park Avenue South, the Germania Life Insurance Building, an individual landmark, it, uh, Borough of Manhattan, Block 873, Lot 1. It's an application for a certificate of appropriateness. A second empire style commercial building designed by Dench and Yost and built in 1910 to 11. And the application is to install a rooftop addition, bulkheads and mechanical equipment. Great, thank you. And before we begin, um, let's make a motion to open the proceeding so the applicants can present. Uh, Commissioner Chapin, would you make that motion? Uh, make a motion. I make a motion uh, so that the applicants uh, can. Okay, to open, open the proceedings, Commissioner open. Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second the motion. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, we've opened the proceedings. Edith, will you take us to the applicants? Uh, sure, the applicants have joined um, the proceedings and you now have control of presentation. Um, you just click to begin and you may uh, proceed. Please state your name for the record. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Maxwell Powell. I'm a partner at Bayer Blundevel Architects. Um, I'm here today with my colleague, Gaspar Melek, uh, on behalf of the owner of the building, uh, Marriott International, and the owner's rep, uh, Turner and Townsend. So thank you very much um, for, for, for hearing our uh, proposal today. Um, so we're here in reference to uh, rooftop alterations for 201 Park Avenue South, otherwise known as the W Union Square Hotel in Union Square. Uh, it's actually part of a uh, planned interior renovation for the hotel, which is really the first interior renovation since the hotel opened back in 1999. So it's been about 20 years. Um, as part of that, um, uh, that program, there are a number of infrastructure upgrades that are necessary for mechanical uh, and life safety systems, as well as a programmatic uh, change to be able to occupy the roof. Uh, so this proposal seeks to accommodate both of those requirements in a rational and appropriate manner while furthering the relevance of this very important and iconic building on, on Union Square. Uh, so just one note, there are no proposed changes to any of the historic facade uh, elements on the building. Um, all of the modifications are limited uh, to the roof excel, uh, itself above the mansard. Um, so with that, let's see if I can click this along. All right. So, you know, just a quick reference point that, you know, the building is uh, on Park Avenue South and East 17th Street on the northeast corner, uh, just east of the Ladies Mile Historic District and the Gramercy Park uh, Historic District uh, just south of that. The building was designated as an individual landmark back in 1988. Um, so, you know, as we start, we like to kind of go through into a quick timeline of sort of the changes that have occurred to the building over time. Um, as, uh, as Caroline uh, mentioned, the building was built in 1910, 1911, designed by Dench and Yost. Uh, the photo on the left is a photo back in 1910 during construction. Uh, and on the right is, you know, as it was built. And it is a, gr a great example of a, of a tripartite columnar uh, skyscraper design with a very uh, robust and rusticated three-story base, a very sort of streamlined and consistent uh, middle section of the, of the tower. And then it's all capped by a four-story mansard roof at the very top of the building uh, and contrasted uh, by a very sort of unique and sort of industrial, and I guess at the time, modern 
uh, signage element that sort of ran the entire length along 17th Street, which was really quite unique and you know, sort of one of the most iconic elements of uh, the building's facade. Um, in 1918, uh, the buildings uh, or the company's name changed uh, partially due to World War I from Germania Life to Guardian Life. Um, and so the sign changed. But I think the photo that you see here on the right here is you know, sort of an elevated photo that shows so the rooftop uh, existing bulkhead uh, as well as you know, sort of chimneys and other elements that really kind of you know, just reflected the functional nature of the rooftop. And, and you'll see that sort of, um, sort of as changes occurred over time to the roof, you know, the, the roof really sort of responded to the needs of the building over time uh, and the uses of the building. Um, by 1940s, we found that um, the, uh, the balcony that uh, was built with the building was removed was removed. So this balcony sort of served the 16th floor. We're not sure why uh, that occurred at that time, but this is um, in many ways sort of the, the most significant change to the exterior of the building as we kind of went through this timeline that this balcony was removed uh, from the building. Uh, in 1957-58, there was a program for um, uh, storefront replacement in all of the infills, so all of the storefronts were replaced. And that brings us to 1960, 1961, which was one of two uh, major um, moments uh, in time for the roof where there were sort of significant changes to the roof. So in 1960, two cooling towers were added to the roof right behind the sign. Uh, so that's sort of uh, visible along the southern face of the building and also from, from the west or the southwest corner looking back up towards the building. By 1988, uh, the building was designated uh, by landmarks, and that takes us to the second moment uh, of change, which was in 1999-2000, when the building was converted from an office building to a hotel, which is the presently the W Union Square Hotel. So in addition to the sign uh, changing, uh, there were, were a number of changes up on the roof in terms of equipment and infrastructure changes. Uh, all the storefronts were replaced again, as well as a new marquee was added uh, to denote the new entry to the building. Um, so uh, that sort of brings us to today. So these are photos um, of, of sort of the current configuration looking back uh, towards the roof of the building. So on the left is the view sort of diagonally across the park uh, from the southwest corner. You can kind of see the equipment that currently exists up on the roof, so these three elements. Um, the view sort of from the south and sort of the equipment and the bulkhead visible behind the sign. And then the view on the eastern face of the, um, of the building, which includes uh, an existing bulkhead that comes out to the east facade. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as one of um, the elements that we're proposing to modify. Um, so we also just quickly looked at uh, sort of the changes, the, the sort of the two major changes uh, to the rooftop itself in terms of its plan. Uh, on the far left uh, is actually the drawing from the original uh, design back in 1910. Uh, 17th Street is running up and down here and Park Avenue South is sort of up along the page going left to right. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is of course, you know, buildings of this era, you know, when you look at the original drawings uh, and what was intended and what was actually built, there's usually, you know, some differences um, uh, it, or it's not atypical to find some differences. So in this, case, you know, the, the skylights were sort of oriented in the north-south direction. There were eight of them. What was built was, you know, or skylights that went in the other direction. There were more of them. There were about 12 of them, um, as well as the bulkhead itself was a little bit bigger in reality uh, when it was built. And then if you flip over to the first um, moment of change back in 1960, um, this shows a configuration of the two cooling towers that were placed uh, right behind the sign. So this portion right here where my hand is, is the armature for the sign. And uh, the, the two rectangular boxes are the uh, two cooling towers that were installed in 1960. And then in 1999, when the building was converted to the W Hotel, you know, additional changes were added. So the, there was a cooling tower that remained on the southeast side of the building. Um, the cooling tower that was on the corner was replaced by a large air handling unit, additional fans and duct work and all of that stuff. And a new generator was added to the um, northwest corner fronting uh, Park Avenue South. So those are sort of the main changes, as well as some internal changes uh, within the bulkhead. So uh, water tanks were added uh, internal to the building. Um, and then just sort of pictorially, you can kind of see, um, you know, uh, the, the sort of the three moments as it was built, um, the condition after the 1960s when the two cooling towers are added, and then what, where we're at today with the cooling tower, large air handling unit, and then right here, the, uh, the generator sort of poking up on Park Avenue South. 
Um, you know, so for us, what was interesting also was we wanted to go back and just take a look at, you know, um, other hotels that were sort of built in the same time that this building was built, right? Obviously our building was built as an office building, um, but we wanted to see, you know, how did those hotels deal with rooftops, right? And we found, you know, a number of examples, including the Astor Hotel, the Biltmore and the Ritz-Carlton, you know, utilizing their rooftops. And it was really part and parcel with the use of the hotel uh, as built uh, back in uh, back in the 1910s. Um, and it, they came in different configurations. So whether they were sort of entirely enclosed or entirely open or partially open or enclosed, you know, they really kind of fit within sort of the, um, the, the style and sort of the use of the building. So it was just interesting for us, you know, now that this building is a hotel, were there elements in, you know, that kind of informed how, how um, outdoor spaces might be used? Um, so how do, so then the question really for us is, well, how do we turn this, which is what we have currently up on the roof into something that could deal with both the infrastructure issues of upgrade, upgrading the building and making it relevant and useful for the building moving forward, but also creating open space, uh, both indoor and outdoor uh, to be able to be used up on the roof. So just a little bit of point of reference. This is the generator that's uh, basically in the northwest corner of the building facing Park Avenue South. This is the cooling tower. And then this here on the right is really all the stuff that's on the southwest corner of the building currently, right behind the W and the U uh, of the sign, which is in, in, includes the air handling unit, duct work, and a whole bunch of fans and a bunch of other stuff in there. Um, so just pictorially, again, as a diagram, this is where we are today in terms of uh, the elements. The, the, the generator, this is Park Avenue South right here, 17th Street's right down in here. Generator, bulkheads, um, existing bulkhead all in here, as well as the air handling unit and the cooling tower. So what we've done here is I've highlighted in sort of this red dashed line, the elements that we're proposing to change and to modify in order for us to kind of meet those uh, that dual objective, right? So one of the first things we needed to do was to try to free up as much as we could on the southwest corner and, and western facade, or I guess western facing portion of the roof so that we can create enough space to make the rooftop usable. Um, so one of the first things we did was we actually are proposing to raise the walking surface along the southwest corner. And the reason for that is the existing parapet wall is quite high, it's almost seven feet tall. So we're proposing to raise the, the sort of the pavers uh, at this location by about 30 inches so that the relationship of someone on the roof relative to the existing parapet wall would feel more like a traditional sort of guardrail parapet condition. Uh, when we did that, of course, that has a little bit of a um, 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 of effect, of course, on the uh, stair bulkhead, which would also have to raise by about the same amount of height so that we can actually get up onto the, onto the roof terrace. Um, we're also proposing to add a um, elevator, a two-stop hydraulic elevator to provide ADA access up to the roof. And that would be located sort of right in this location right here. Um, and, and all of that, of course, would then require us to kind of rethink what we're doing with all of the equipment up here. So first off, all of this stuff here, which is the air handling unit and fans would get shifted broken up into multiple pieces of equipment, but lower pieces of equipment and tucked away in other locations on the roof so they're hidden. Um, and we're proposing for the generator, which otherwise needs to grow to meet today's uh, life safety requirements uh, for loads, uh, we found a spot uh, within an enlarged um, enclosure within the bulkhead. So I'll explain what that's all about. But um, we were really concerned about growing an existing generator, which is currently just sitting out there unscreened. It's just a piece of equipment that's up on the roof, growing it and, you know, potentially pushing it closer to Park Avenue South, which would make it more visible. So we we're able to find some unused space within this existing bulkhead here and expanding that bulkhead so that we can actually take that generator and move it indoors, which we thought was a sort of a very good trade-off uh, in terms of sort of uh, cleaning up the roof over here. So if you take a look at all of those infrastructure elements, this is ultimately what we get just from a pure infrastructure point of view, right? So the, um, the walking surface on the southwest corner of the roof, we would raise, as I mentioned, up 30 inches. So we have a better relationship with the existing parapet. Um, the stair bulkhead grows by about 30 inches as well. Sorry, about four, about four, four feet so that we can get out onto the roof. And then this little box here is the um, existing uh, or so the proposed uh, elevator 
bulkhead coming up, which would of course uh, uh, relocate the generator that's there now. Um, and then this portion here would be the expanded bulkhead. So uh, just a couple notes, the, the expanded bulkhead does grow in height, but it grows up to the height of an existing Northern wall, this, uh, this wall in gray here. So we're not going any higher than that. We took great pains to try to compress everything as best we could to make sure that we didn't go higher than what's there today. The growth of the bulkhead towards the south grows by about nine feet. So that nine feet would then allow us to uh, completely enclose the generator within an indoor space. Uh, and then all of that equipment that was here gets broken up into smaller pieces of equipment and tucked sort of behind the parapet wall. And, and the fact that we raised the, um, the walking surface actually allows us to tuck some of the duct work and piping and all of that stuff underneath the walking surface to sort of further hide that as well. So uh, the second part of the proposal, of course, is also the, um, the, uh, the glass enclosed structure, right? So we're proposing a very sort of contemporary but simple and streamlined uh, enclosed structure that would basically hug the, uh, the bulkhead components. Um, and we picked the system intentionally that would allow us to sort of simplify the structure and allow us to um, have a system that would um, minimize the sight lines back up in the building. So what's interesting about the system is that each of these pieces is one element. So it's a self-supporting system that's only supported at the base here and at the, um, at, at the bulkhead wall. So what's nice about that is we don't have a whole bunch of columns and other structural work that we have to deal with, but it also allows us to create a form that has a lower eave line along the perimeter, which again helps minimize any visibility back up uh, towards the building, um, but also helps us uh, in terms of, um, of, of creating a very simple structure that can also open and close. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. Um, the other thing we did here is we chamfered the corner the southwest corner also in efforts to minimize any uh, sight line views that you might see from, from a distance back up uh, to the building. Um, go to the next slide. So this is just a quick diagram again, sort of where we were or are today, the proposal with all the infrastructure and the glass enclosure, and then the potential for the glass enclosure to actually open up uh, so that we can really be able to use the rooftop in all seasons, which is really, I think, uh, um, especially given today where we are, uh, sort of a real benefit of, of this type of system. Uh, so what I have here is just a series of before and afters in plan and elevation to kind of give you a sense of sort of the change from today to the proposal. So this is the existing plan, the generator, Park Avenue South is on the left, 17th Street's along the, along the bottom of the page, the existing um, HVAC unit and all the ductwork and the cooling tower, as well as the existing bulkhead. Uh, and then this is the proposal in plan, right? So again, the uh, glass enclosed structure, sort of hugging the, uh, the bulkhead components, which are back here. The cooling tower will stay in its same position. Uh, we're still evaluating whether or not the cooling tower needs to be replaced, but it would be replaced in kind if that uh, does occur. Um, and then the uh, equipment being tucked in behind the wall on the east side, as well as the enlarged uh, bulkhead enclosure over here. Um, in elevation, so this is the, um, the south elevation, which would be at the 17th Street elevation. This is the existing condition. So you'll see the cooling tower right in here, the existing fan unit right here, the bulkhead that's beyond, uh, and uh, what we're proposing today. So again, sort of a very sort of simple streamlined uh, rooftop edition, a glass and metal edition, uh, that again, I think with the sort of uh, sloped shed roof of the enclosure allows for a, for a very sort of simplified form upon the roof, but also to minimize uh, the sight lines of that as well. Uh, you'll see here, uh, sort of in the background, the um, expanded bulkhead back in here. So if I just, if I can go back, okay, you can kind of see back here, this is the existing wall on the north wall. And as proposed, we are not going any higher than that. And we're also maintaining the easterly most wall. So if we go back again, the edge of that wall, which is sort of set back a couple feet from the mansard roof itself, uh, is maintained. That same line is, is maintained. So we, we, we didn't want to sort of further encroach on sort of the, the projection of that um, bulkhead. Uh, the comparison here, here of the Park Avenue South elevation. So on the left is existing, on the right is as proposed. And again, sort of uh, the generator uh, being relocated. Um, what you'll see here is the um, glass uh, enclosure. 
sort of wrapping the bulkhead. You'll also notice that uh, the glass enclosures are set back from the parapet. So it's actually set back about eight feet from the parapet wall along 17th Street uh, as compared to the existing um, uh, mechanical equipment, which is actually just a couple feet behind the sign. Um, and then the elevation, uh, the east elevation. Uh, so this is if you were to view it sort of from from the east, uh, from Irving Place, let's say, um, and you'll see the uh, the expansion in height of the uh, the bulkhead matching the line of the existing northerly wall and the south southern extension of that same bulkhead. We would be matching the same materiality uh, that's there today, which is a, a standing seam copper. So we'll do a prepatinated uh, copper standing seam uh, to match the same uh, finishes that are up there on the roof today. Uh, we have a couple slides of what this rooftop um, uh, enclosure would look like. Uh, so it is a prefabricated system. So it's a system that we would be, um, uh, uh, be ordering uh, and installing. And, and this section here kind of shows sort of the, the basic geometry of it. So it's literally sort of an L-shaped piece that's about seven feet wide and it just sort of leans to up against the bulkhead. And uh, elements of these panels can open up and nest onto each other. So that we thought was really sort of a nice feature of, um, of this enclosure. So these two panels could nest over here and open up and these four panels can all nest and open up as well. Um, in terms of the materiality, the, the framing is in a powder coated aluminum framing. Uh, we are proposing a medium bronze color to match the uh, and work with the copper, the prepatinated copper on the roof. Um, the walls will be a one inch uh, clear IGU uh, glass unit and the roof will have a uh, one inch um, polycarbonate roof so that there's a little bit of uh, diff diffusion of the light uh, coming in uh, from the structure. So we did a few sightline studies just to show uh, what you would actually see, uh, given how visible this building is. Um, a mock-up was installed and it, I think it's still up right now. Um, and if I just draw your attention to the Southwest corner, this was what was mocked up, all the elements in red. So we mocked up the bulkhead expansion, the uh, expansion to the stair and elevator bulkhead, as well as the sort of overall outline of the glass enclosure in red over here. Uh, and what we've done is uh, a series of side-by-sides. So this is the view sort of from the farmer's market um, on roughly uh, 16th Street, uh, looking back towards the building. On the left is an existing photo from that vantage point. On the middle would be uh, any rendered um, uh, simulation of what you would see. And on the right would be the photo uh, showing uh, the mock-up. Um, it, it so happens that in this view, you don't see anything uh, today or um, as, as proposed. So there's actually really no change in any of these photos. Uh, if we take a walk further south uh, towards um, 15th Street and Park Avenue South, looking north towards the building, you can start to see you know, a little bit of uh, a differentiation between what's there today and what is being proposed. So currently you do see, uh, I, can, I don't think I can zoom in here. Um, okay. There, I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, so you'll see the cooling tower, uh, the uh, HVAC unit right behind the W and the U. And with the proposal, of course, this piece of equipment goes away and you don't see the enclosure from this vantage point. So it actually kind of cleans up the view uh, behind the sign, which we thought was a, a, a nice uh, feature. Um, if we move further south, so now we are actually between 13th and 14th Street on Broadway, looking back up towards the building before the building kind of gets obscured by the buildings on, um, on, uh, on Broadway. Uh, you can see the existing condition, which is, includes the, uh, the cooling tower, the uh, HVAC equipment, and also back in here, that's actually the bulkhead beyond. So that's the elevator bulkheads that currently exist uh, beyond. And then what is uh, being proposed. So if I zoom in a little bit here, so we can do that. Uh, you can kind of see a little bit better. So, um, So here we are. So you'll see uh, in gray here, this is the, um, the glass enclosure that you can kind of see poking up a little bit there below the sign. But behind that is the uh, elevator bulkhead as well. So everything that you see here is sort of within the sight line of what you would otherwise see. Um, and that's sort of proven out by the, um, the mock-up photo right here. So this orange panel here is actually the end of the Eastern end of the glass enclosed structure, which is this panel right in here. So you will see a little bit from, I guess, four blocks away, uh, but I think you would see less uh, than what is there today, as well as uh, a more streamlined look 
up on the roof. Let me zoom back out. Okay. Um, so this is the view from the east. So if we are on Irving Place looking west, uh, you'll see the um, basically the only change here is the expanded bulkhead. So we've taken the bulkhead and we have increased its height and we match the existing northerly wall, the northerly masonry wall, uh, and we've expanded it westward uh, to be able to house the entire uh, generator component. Um, and the size of it is shown here in the mock-up as well. And then I think the last view that you actually do see a difference is uh, this view here, which is on the west side of Union Square uh, and 15th Street looking back on the corner. Uh, so today you would see the cooling tower, the HVAC equipment, as well as part of the generator poking up. Uh, and as proposed, uh, of course, all of that stuff on the corner goes away. You do see a slight amount of the uh, enclosure sort of poking up along uh, the Park Avenue side south, um, south of it. And uh, you can see that sort of proven out in the uh, mock-up as well. Right. And then we went around the rest, uh, around the other streets as well, but uh, none of these uh, views that we're gonna show you now actually change from before and after, but also I'll just kind of skip through them rather quickly. This is uh, a view from uh, Broadway looking eastward uh, back towards the building. Uh, the next view is uh, from Park Avenue South looking south uh, from uh, 18th Street looking back. And again, there's no, there's no change uh, before or after. Uh, and then of course, sort of the, the direct sight line views because of the mansard roof and the configuration, um, you, you don't, there's, there's no difference um, in, in there either. So, um, you know, with that, you know, we're really uh, pleased um, and, and really excited about uh, this, this proposal and kind of marrying the, the dual uh, realities of trying to figure out how to get this building uh, up to snuff in terms of uh, today's codes and sort of requirements, but also, um, you know, creating some outdoor space and rooftop access, which I think for us is very important as architects and especially important in today's um, environment. So um, um, uh, we hope that what we what we proposed here is rational um, and, and appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? I think it was a, a very detailed and thorough presentation. So we may not have questions just yet. All right, not seeing any hands. I think we'll turn and to testimony. So if you're in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa to see if we have anyone signed up or here to speak. Lisa? Yes, we don't have anybody signed up to speak um, and I don't see any hands raised. Thanks. Rich, have we received any written testimony on this item? We have received a resolution from Manhattan Community Board 5 recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, I also wanna just note for the record that um, Commissioner Bland is recused on this item and has been absent from the meeting from the beginning of this presentation. Um, and Commissioner Chen has also um, had to step out for another meeting, so he has not been present for this item either. Um, okay, commissioners, any final questions? Okay, I think we will go ahead and move into our discussion. And I'm starting to unmute all of you. So look for the request on your screen and accept it. Um, and I think, um, you know, in many ways, this is uh, an application of sort of a substitute of, of, of rooftop of accretions uh, features. And I think in many ways, it, it, in many of the views, if the, um, the substitution wow. is much less um, visible than the existing condition. So I think that's positive. Um, there is some minimal visibility. And then obviously over the Irving, from Irving Place over what is a designed facade, but not the sort of primary view facade. Um, it does get a little more visible, the bulkhead. So any thoughts on this? Um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you like to start? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, first of all, I, I wanna thank the applicant for a, uh, um, for a very um, concise and, and specific presentation. Um, often, you know, I, I sort of feel like I'm, the, vis the true visibility is being ob obscured to me. And here, you know, we really zoomed in on it and gave me a, a, the ability to see exactly what it was that was changing. Um, and and um, I, I think this is uh, 
perfectly acceptable and appropriate. Uh, the um, you know the visibility is minimal from most angles, except perhaps the east, um, and uh, and it's part of a roofscape that's been this way uh, with a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, mechanicals, etc., for a long, long time, and it's not really changing for the worse, and in some ways, it's changing for the better. And activating this roof um, is is uh, you know also I, I enjoyed the fact that they showed us other ways in which uh, rooftops were typically activated, not today, but back back then. Um, and so uh, this, you know, conforms to that expectation as well. Great. Thank you. And Commissioner Shamir Barron? I'm in agreement with everything that uh, Commissioner Gustafson just said. I think this is absolutely appropriate and a good cleanup for what's there now. Great. Great. Uh, Commissioner Holford-Smith? I agree. My initial concern had been the, the increased visibility of the stair bulkhead, but I think it's the benefit of hiding the generator um, and cleaning up the roof um, makes it makes a good trade-off. So I think it's perfectly um, appropriate as it is. Okay, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, I agree with the remarks of previous commissioners and I think this is a well-designed uh, solution and actually has less negative impact on visibility uh, and I can definitely approve it. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. I agree. Commissioner Devonshire. If, if I may, Sarah, uh, our firm did, this is truly a, a magnificent and monumental roof. Our firm restored this roof in the 1990s. And, and to give you an idea of the scale, each of those little blips on the parapet at the top are flame uh, finials, and each of those is three feet high, they're, and they're made up... Wow of 16 different stampings. And, and because Guardian Life at that time wanted the project done so fast, we couldn't get it done by the one company in the country who could do things, WF Norman. We hired a company in New Jersey that essentially did repoussé work, doing a lot of the, the, the stamping and hammering by hand. I mean, it, it, was, it was an amazing job. I have always been surprised that the W Hotel hadn't put an addition up on this thing because it really, it's almost the size of a football field up there. It's, it's <laughs> monstrous. In any case, um, I'm totally um, in favor of, of this. And it's just one more beautiful thing on, to me, what is my favorite roof in, in New York City. So thumbs up. That's great. Thank you. It's great to have those personal experiences and personal knowledge. It, it was magnificent to, to work on this thing. Great. All right. And Commissioner Jefferson. I agree with my fellow commissioners. Okay. All right. So I think we have a consensus here. So um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you read the motion? Uh, in the matter of LPC 21-01179, 201 Park Avenue South, the Germania Life Insurance Building and Individual Landmark, the application is to install a rooftop addition, bulkheads, and mechanical equipment. Uh, the I recommend approval, uh, finding that the proposed work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features of the roof, that the relocation, upgrade, and consolidation of existing rooftop mechanical equipment, which will bring the building up to code requirements, will simplify the building's roofscape and reduce visibility of mechanical equipment when looking north, that the bulkheads will be clad with materials such as copper and light colored metal, which will harmonize with the building's material and color palette, that historically and currently the building featured numerous highly visible accretions, including a neon sign on a metal armature, large bulkheads and other equipment visible from many angles, and that the proposed alterations, including enlarging an existing bulkhead, relocating mechanicals and installing a seasonal greenhouse structure are in keeping with the history of cha changes on this complex roofscape, that the expanded bulkhead will be mainly visible from the east and will not be visible from Park Avenue or Union Square Park, which are the most prominent building views, that the greenhouse structure, which while partially visible from the south, will replace existing visible mechanical equipment and will be seen behind and in conjunction with the massive sign armature, and therefore will not call undue attention to itself, that the presence of these visible <coughs> operations are minimal in scale compared to the large building. And given the presence of the historic sign and bulkheads, they will not call undue attention to themselves. But there's a long history of rooftop gardens on hotel buildings throughout the city, 
And while the building was originally built as an office tower, it was later adapted to become a hotel and the greenhouse structure and viewing platform supports the activation of the roof in a manner consistent with traditional rooftop hotel amenities and that the proposed work will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of the landmark. Thank you, Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? She's muted. Second. <laughs> okay. Sorry. And thank you. Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. No, he's recused. Recused. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, Commissioner yes. Shamir Barron. Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with eight in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. That's approved. Thank you. And we will now move to our public hearing agenda for the Preservation Department. Um, the first item on the public hearing agenda is item number one, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the Borough of Brooklyn, docket number 21-01765-135 Plymouth Street, also known as 1 to 15 Adams Street and 2 through 10 John Street in the Dumbo Historic District. Uh, Brooklyn, Block 18, Lot 1, a Romanesque revival style factory building designed by William B. Tubby and built in 1891, and a component of 135 Plymouth Street, a factory complex occupying the entire block, consisting of three attached buildings built between 1879 and 1904. The application is to install signage. And commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Um, please unmute yourselves and state your name for the record and you may begin. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Good. Good morning. My name is Sonia Covington. I'm with Brooklyn Public Library. I'm the director of capital planning and I'm just here to uh, present uh, our library that's going to be proposed at um, 135 Plymouth. We're at the ground floor of that building and this is a presentation of the signage. This branch comes out of um, our expansion in downtown Brooklyn. We have a renovation going on in Brooklyn Heights, another branch um, at the Walt Whitman, and this branch will service an area that's currently not serviced by its own library, which is the Dumbo, Farragut, uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard area. And with that, I hand it over to Dan Wood, the architect, principal of Work AC. Thank you. Hello, commissioners. and. Uh, everyone else. Uh, very excited to come and present this uh, relatively small project. I'm here uh, as a principal of Work AC, and we are working in collaboration with Link by Air, which is a graphic design firm um, on this project. Um, this is the, uh, the situation. This is um, not only uh, serving a, a community that doesn't have access to a library right now, but it's also going to be the first new branch in the Brooklyn Public Library system to open uh, in more than 30 years uh, since 1983. Uh, so it's really a, an important moment and a really a important um, project um, for us and for BPL. It's located, uh, this is as Dumbo as Dumbo can get. It is literally down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. Um, and uh, as Sonia mentioned, it is designed to represent uh, three distinct communities, really, the, the Vinegar Hill, Brooklyn Navy Yards area, Farragut Houses uh, in yellow here, and uh, Dumbo, which is in green. And as a result, you know, we wanted to make sure that this uh, um, branch library was really open uh, to all and, and as the library should be a, a truly public space for all members of the community and to reach out to people who might not otherwise think this is in their community to really make sure uh, that we're not just addressing Dumbo, but really uh, embracing, where, which is where the library is, but really embracing all the communities and really work to make sure this is a visible, vibrant, public, open institution um, for this neighborhood. Uh, so the design that we came up with after working in um, close collaboration with the community members and our community engagement efforts 
Um, I won't go too into it, but it's, it's essentially adult and teen spaces wrapping around a central core of a community room, a large flexible community room, and a large children's area in orange in the middle. Um, and all the different programmatic elements were really worked out and discussed um, in these community engagement meetings. And this shows the inside. As a side note, you know, this is a really interesting uh, factory building with years of accretion of, of history. And even on the inside, we're maintaining the existing brick and, um, uh, and, and also some of the paint that's on the brick and on the existing wood ceilings, we were able to get a, a dispensation from DOB uh, to uh, classify this as a heavy timber structure, which meant that we didn't have to add fireproofing. And you'll actually see the old wooden beams and wooden ceiling through these cutouts. Um, so this idea of visibility is very important on the inside, but it's also very important on the outside. It has an amazing site with all these windows that look out onto Brooklyn Bridge Park and out to Manhattan uh, and down under the under the bridge. Um, and you know the building sticks out so that it it, it does have this. Uh, it has no buildings in front of it at the portion that's dedicated to the library, as you see here. However, it is a bit of a you know a smaller building in the district, and it's really in a way overshadowed by, literally overshadowed by the bridge, uh, you see the shadow here, um, but also by its, its neighbors. So while it has this kind of strong presence um, on its site, it's also strangely anonymous. It's also an enormous building as, as um, mentioned by Stan at the beginning. It's a full block, it's three buildings put together. It's very heavy brick, dark brick, a kind of Teutonic uh, uh, brick. Um, and it will have a number of uh, tenants at the ground floor of which the library will just be one. So it also has this kind of anonymous character um, within the building itself, just because it's such a large building and we are a small part of this ground floor. Um, and so we really wanted to kind of uh, create what we call a beacon, you know, and to utilize, you know, what we've seen in the city as kind of these historic uh, beacons to, to draw people to important parts of infrastructure and, and public. And inside the building, we're doing that through these kind of hanging beacons that, uh, that utilize the, the transparency through the project to identify the different areas in very generic terms. This is for teens, this is for books, this is info, et cetera. Uh, and on the outside, we wanted to do something similar, a kind of marquee moment um, where this building would kind of announce itself as a new public institution for the city um, in, a, in a very vibrant uh, way that really do, you know, calls attention to itself. So when we looked around the district, we uh, saw this is the building itself uh, in 1915, shortly after completion when it was the Bliss Company. And you see that it's characterized by this very large graphics uh, for the Bliss Company, uh, both on the building itself uh, in two different locations and on the water towers in this image. Later, when this became the wearing envelope company, there's also still existing um, moments of signage on the building. And, you know, I think it's important to realize that these were not just billboards, but by being directly on the building were also important ways for people to identify the building within the city. So they're, they're more like a wayfinding or a sign uh, as much as it is advertising or billboard. Um, and you see this all throughout this district. So this district is, is in a way unique because of all the old factory buildings, many of which still retain um, this, this kind of uh, signage. So this is the Thompson Meter Company building, the Sweeney Manufacturing uh, Company building had it in Dumbo, the Brillo factory, um, Pierlux Paints, which also appears to be Pierless Paints. Uh, so there they have two names on the building I noticed. Uh, and then of course, most famously in the district, the Eagle Warehouse. Um, uh, building with its very, very large sign, both at the top and, and around the arch at the, at the base. And I just want to point out that within the Dumbo district, this um, idea of kind of um, direct painting on the building itself has been utilized by retail um, tenants um, to identify. This is um, Empire Stores, which was approved um, by Landmarks uh, previously. So what we are proposing is to put the word library in a very large and very um, vibrant way on the building to announce the entrance and to do this on Adam Street um, so that it really emphasizes our entrance. I, I forgot to mention, but we are also sharing an entrance with a retail tenant to the right. So we really want to emphasize that this is the library, this is for you, and to use not, you know, not a, a, a trade name or not a specific name, but a really a very generic word that resonates so deeply with so many people, library, 
um, to identify this as a public institution and something that's really new and vibrant for the community. And we're doing that both through paint um, and a, a kind of graphic, um, a, a, a dot pattern, a frit pattern on the windows. So you'll read the letters through the windows. It'll be white on the outside, black on the inside. So you'll be able to see still very clearly through the windows from the inside. Um, and here you see it. We also are proposing a small sign, uh, changeable sign with the hours uh, next to the door, identifying the, the specific branch. Um, and I do want to point out that this building, um, the ground floor currently is painted. So uh, while the bricks, the uh, existing brick is exposed above the ground floor, the ground floor is painted. It's not only painted, it's painted in kind of an ugly color, um, which has been patched and changed uh, throughout time. Um, so originally we were thinking we would just kind of add another layer of history, but I think the paint is in such um, bad shape that what we are gonna, what we are proposing is to repaint the ground floor uh, in a more uh, sympathetic and um, nice color, um, and then to add the, the white paint on top, um, which of course all of this will be removable. So um, at some point in the future, if, if things change. So we're proposing Navajo red, which is a nice orangey red. The interior, as you remember, has these orange elements. It also resonates really well with that dark brick, um, but we didn't want to go as dark as the brick. We do want to make sure that it's clear that this is new and this is different from what's above. Uh, and then here you see the perforated um, material that we're proposing and the white paint, you're just going to have to imagine it's white. Um, and on just going over to uh, the John Street side here in this image, you see that we are going to put the more traditional Brooklyn Public Library sign there to kind of, you know, not to make a big deal, but to maybe draw people if they're coming from um, from the north around the building to Adam Street, um, where they will see how to get in. I should point out that the windows and everything like that, the window replacement were all part of a previous application uh, approved and already installed uh, as well as that handicap ramp and things like that. So we're really just looking at the signage elements. Uh, and this will be very um, typical uh, mounted um, letters uh, offset from the building. And these are the two facades. So that's our project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, not seeing any hands raised. I see one. Hi, sorry about that. Um, just a quick question. Do, is there any um, coordination or planning with how this facade treatments going to relate to the rest of the bottom of the building? Uh, right now, we don't know who the tenant will be. For example, in this rendering, you see the, the change. Um, we do want to kind of make sure that our, our side is emphasized, but I, I would imagine when a tenant is chosen, uh, we could coordinate with them uh, to make sure that the paint is consistent. At this time, the landlord doesn't have a tenant lined up for that space. Thank you. Sorry, Commissioner Jefferson. Yes, I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, one has to do with, um, if you could help me out, on page 25, if you go to page 25. Sure, yeah, if I can. Yeah, oh, it was the same image. Yeah, and, and then go to page 20, 23. <clears throat> yeah. I'm looking at the left-hand side and the windows have square heads on the top. And and the it looks like there's some kind of cornice, but I'm not sure. And then go to page 20, 25 and they're rounded corners. Are you changing the window heads? We are not changing anything with the windows. Uh, that is interesting. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're not changing anything with the windows. Oh, okay. So the, the so oh. sorry about that. I don't know why they got rounded. I think they were originally rounded. Is that true, Troy? I think it's because they're rounded on the interior of the space, and uh, uh -huh. it's supposed to be flat on the outside. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. just and, my apologies. That is not a proposed change. Okay, we weren't I, trying to sneak that through on you. And the second issue is um, I like I like the project and I think the scale is nice. The public 
Brooklyn Public Library, the scale is so different from the big one. Is, is, it, is it just contrast or should it be larger? <laughs> um, we like the contrast. We, we just want to make sure that it's clear where the entrance is because I, I do feel it, it could be, you know, we want to make a big deal at the entrance side, um, but give a little hint as people come around the corner. That, that, that is the idea. Um, and we looked at several different sizes and, and felt that this is, you know, it's still, it, it's still going to have a presence on the street because of the conflict in color. But, you know, we, we felt this was the appropriate size. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, not seeing any hands. We'll move to testimony. And if you are in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And we will start with anyone who signed up in advance. So I'll turn it over to Lisa to walk us through that. Great. Thank you, Sarah. We had one person sign up and one person with a hand raise. That's Doreen Gallo. So Doreen, I've just brought you in. You just need to unmute yourself, turn on camera if you choose, and please state your name for the record. Hi, I am Doreen Gallo. Uh, good morning, Chair Carroll, Commissioners, Lisa. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the signage for our new library on behalf of the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance. We're very involved and very excited about the library. Our committee has reviewed the proposal and we support the signage proposed for the John Street side of the building. As far as the bold stark white library sign on Adams Street, we would like to see something more scaled back. The applicant refers in his proposal to the neighborhood context for the proposed painted signage on Adams Street and gives examples of what they call painted super graphics. And in the presentation today, two of the um, buildings cited are in the Fulton Ferry Historic District. Uh, the Empire Stores and the Eagle Warehouse are not in the Dumbo Historic District. Um, we believe that uh, this approach is problematic. Historically, if the signage was stark white, it was against the brick of the building, not white paint on rust colored brick paint, which is more stark, more often than not is on the corner of this building where there's a great example of the wearing envelope signage. The white lettering is on black painted background. The facade of this building with the bold white painted library sign faces the Manhattan Bridge, Bridge Park, the river, and the once Belgian Brock streetscape that has now been destroyed and brings too much attention to the graphics over the building. The Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance urges LPC to scale back the painted signage on Adams Street, and we would prefer that some version of the library sign be painted above the windows, more in keeping with the historic signage in the district. We also are concerned that the wearing envelope sign is going to be scrubbed from this building. And we want to see that it is retained. I reached out to the designers, but I have not heard back on this issue yet. This is a cornerstone building on the river on a boundary of our historic district. The proposal, although painted seemingly temporary, will define the facade rather than enhance it. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you, Doreen. And with that, I don't see any of the hands raised. Okay, thank you. Rich, have we received any written testimony? Uh, we do have a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board to recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Dan, would you like to respond to the comments? Please sure. go ahead. Sorry. Um, I um, understand, I think, um, well, first of all, we're, the wearing envelope, we, we don't, that's not in our purview, um, uh, but you know, we are, this landlord is great. I actually had a studio in this building in the early 1990s, which, so it's a really important building to me and I've loved Dumbo since I moved there in 1980, 89. Um, and so, um, and this building has changed a lot. So I do think, you know, the landlord would be open to that. Um, so regarding the scale, I, you know, it, it this is a public, this is not a, a commercial project and it's a public project. And I think we really want to make sure that this is something for everyone and that the word library is, you know, it's, it's not for me, seeing the word library usually brings a warm feel to people's hearts. I think this is an enormous building. It's a full block. And I think within the context of that, this 
um, large super graphic is, is not perhaps as large as when you zoom in on these. Um, it's also, you know, it's in this crazy place with the bridge and the noise of the trains passing overhead. It's, it's not a, it's a very kind of urban situation. Um, and there are huge new commercial buildings, com, you know, uh, luxury condos and things much bigger than our building. I, I do think that within the context of this corner, um, a big word library that's really trying to bring people in from not just Dumbo, you know, but really the communities um, to make sure that this is, is truly a public space for, for, for everyone uh, and to really be an inviting, it, it is meant to be inviting, so. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, any final questions? Okay, not seeing any questions. I'm going to start to unmute you all so we can close the hearing and move into our discussion. So Commissioner Bland, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And uh, Commissioner Gustafson, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, all in favor of closing the aye. hearing, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And um, I wanna thank the applicants for their presentation. Um, and, and I think, and I wanna thank Doreen Gallo for her testimony. And um, we've heard a response about the size of this sign on the entrance facade and, and the public nature of this adaptive reuse. So I think that'll factor into our discussion as we move along. Commissioner Jefferson, would you like to start this one since you were uh, engage oh, sure. questions? Sure, sure. sure. Um, <clears throat> I like it, Patrick. I, I think because of the scale of the building, the super graphic is fine. I think at the pedestrian level, it would work very well. I, I think it's inventive. Um, and I think the Brooklyn Public Library could be a bit bigger, <laughs> but that's not important. I think it, it works well. And I think the super graphic in relationship to the windows it's, it's interesting and I, I, I would accept it. Okay, great. And I'm gonna go the other way to a sort of near resident commissioner, Commissioner Bland. A near resident, right. Um, you know, a typical library from time immemorial uh, expresses itself uh, and its public role through its architecture, uh, columns, you know, art deco, whatever it is, it's, it's always expressed as a public important building. Um, this library and this building can't do that. Um, it, it, it's, it, it is assumed sus into this larger uh, factory building. Um, so, so I think the applicant has made a, a, a terrific case for making this public and visible and welcoming to all uh, and not just the immediately surrounding community. Uh, I, I bought into all of that argument completely. And um, I think that the super graphic is a fabulous and creative way of doing it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's inspired by um, somewhat smaller, but nonetheless painted signs on the building itself. So uh, I think that all of this is terrific. Um, at first I wondered whether the windows really needed the, uh, uh, the dot pattern, but I think, I think even that creates a, a, a very interesting effect and uh, helps um, uh, helps explain uh, the, the whole notion of this of the super graphic so I'm, I'm not only in support of it I, I, I really uh, applaud it I think it's a terrific idea as a matter of fact okay. Commissioner Devonshire um, I I unfortunately uh, differ here I love everything about the project the the super graphic I feel, the, my initial fear of it is that the next thing that we'll have is a north face justifying doing a similar thing on another similar building in a, in a district um, and using this as their precedent, which strikes fear into me. Um, I, I don't feel that the super graphic is going to be the thing that pulls people to this building. I think they're they're going to be here looking for the library. And so I think an, another form of signage, rethought signage would would do the same thing. It, it's just 
it's too much on, on this building. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. There you go then. Um, I, I think, um, uh, I think first of all, I think that Robert Venturi is smiling. Um, <laughs> this is, so, it's so interesting how, how uh, integrated into the architectural vocabulary his uh, thinking and uh, philosophy ideas have become that it's you know, a matter of course. I think that's interesting. Um, I have no objection to the, the painted uh, uh, lettering. Uh, I think it is appropriate in the district and, and uh, it's been shown uh, to be a feature of the district and of this building. Um, I, uh, I do think that, that um, the, the, if you go to page 12 of 30 though, <laughs> the, the one thing that the, applic that the uh, application package lacked is I'm, I'm actually looking at the image of the uh, entire building with BPL arrow there it is. <clears throat> if you look at that, what I think is going to happen here is that, is that 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 sign, the library sign in the orange paint is going to come right up to the underside of the wearing envelope sign. And that makes me think that the suggestion of one of the, uh, one of the speakers was a good one to consider using the black back backdrop instead of the terracotta color, because I think it will be more or less contiguous with that. And I think the relationship mean this new sign and that preserved existing sign would be stronger with the black base. Um, I would also suggest that the, um, you know, we, we kind of log this with the building and, and that, you know, because it is a painted base already, that we, uh, it would be in the interest, it would be in the landlord's interest to have a master plan for the storefronts so that Michael's concern would be allayed. Okay, and Commissioner Chapin? Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Jefferson and Commissioner Bland. I think it's an inventive way uh, to uh, express this uh, public facility. And I think that in the context of the size of this building and the surrounding buildings that uh, I can really find this appropriate. And I think it's a creative solution I really like the way the overpainting works uh, uh, with the windows as an expression of the library. Uh, so I could I could approve it as presented. Okay, Commissioner Holford Smith. Well, I agree with um, Commissioner Chapin and um, previous commissioners who were in favor of the super graphic. I think it's a very inventive way to draw attention to the library, this location, and. Um, Commissioner Goldblum was concerned about the wearing paint, um, I mean, the wearing envelope painted sign. I believe that's on the opposite corner and not on the same corner as the library. Um, I agree that it should be maintained, but I think it's, it's on the other side of the, of the building. Um, so I'm in favor of the application. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Um, I think that the super graphic is a, an appropriate interpretation of the precedent. Um, and so while I might have been concerned as Commissioner Devonshire is about its future precedent for commercial um, um, use, I, there's enough there that I think in the, both in the district and in the surrounding area that make it be um, appropriate and approvable. I just do think that it is interesting also that this is, um, uh, that we are in a new kind of time for uh, libraries, that they've redefined themselves as kind of vital, once again, vital uh, actors in, a, in, in communities. Um, what I find strange and, and maybe troubling, but maybe this is the expression of the, of in fact, the transformation and the adaptive sort of reuse of the, of, of the type is the absence of the word public. Um, other than the fact that it's on the little sign on the other side. Um, and that was, you know, the public aspect of library was such an important piece. And the question for me is whether or not it's sort of embedded, assumed, or whether that word has lost its 
it's it's meaning it's 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 kind of un, you know the way that it is understood and I and I and I wonder about that now especially um, and but as I see this so on some levels of sort of the the use of the commercial um, method of advertising uh, what you know the 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 activity uh, in this case is sort of suits the, the kind of the, uh, in in a sense the transformation of the of of the ways that libraries are being used the fact that people are in there you know online and and um, using it in different ways so I think on lots of levels this is this makes sense it's complicated but it's appropriate okay thank you Commissioner Gustafson well I'm 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 truly torn about this one. Um, the, uh, um, I, I, I like the super graphic in this situation, and I think it's a very unique situation, you know, particularly the location of the building, uh, the type of building that it is, the, the, the massing of the building, the, uh, um, the, the public use of the building, and then all those things weigh in favor of it. Um, I am, you know, I could just imagine if this was, instead of being a library, if that's, if the exact same building um, it was proposed that the signs say Google or something like that. I, I you know, I, I have a feeling that um, we would have a different reaction. So based on its, its, its use and its, and, and the peculiar situation and uniqueness, um, I, I, I'll, I, I think it's, I think it's appropriate, but I'm, I'm barely there and I am concerned. Okay. So, I also, you know, in this case, find that given the size of the building, the sort of massing of it, the four different sides of it, um, that the signage on this one side based on the historic commercial precedents um, is appropriate. Um, but I do hear people's concerns about the size of this. And I think that, um, well, you know, I think many of us are persuaded because of the adaptive reuse, particularly for our public use. And while we can't factor in use, I think that um, we can note that for the record, you know, future applications would be considered very strictly on their own site conditions. Um, but in this case, I, I would support this. And I think that brings us to six or seven. So I think um, we should maybe make a motion and call the vote and see where we are. So um, Commissioner Jefferson, do you have the motion in front of you? Would you be able to make that? Oh, yes, I think I, I, I do. Um, in a matter of LPC-21-01765, 135 Plymouth Street, AKA 115 Adam Street and 2-10 John Street. A Romanesque style <laughs> revival style factory building designed by William B. Tubby and built in 1891. And a component of 135 Plymouth Street, a factory complex by the entire block consisting of three attached buildings between 1879 and 1904. Signage. Um, I know that the building style, scale, and material and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historical character of the Dumbo Historic District. I recommend approval by finding that the base of the building is presently painted and was painted at the time of designation. Therefore, the application of painting painted signage on the facade will not damage or obscure any significant architectural or historical features of, and it is reversible that this building and many other buildings in this historic district, typical features, large painted signs, advertising, manufacturing and commercial uses within, and that the proposed large graphic covering the building base is in keeping with that tradition for a major tenant, that the pattern vinyl signage at the window, which will be installed in conjunction with the painted signage will not obscure transparency, that the proposed pin mounted lettering above the first four windows appropriate the location of a corner signage. That given the building's monumental quality, the cumulative amount of signage will not overwhelm the building, that the building that the proposed work is supportive of the adapted reuse of the portion of this warehouse building as a library 
and back to work would not diminish the special architectural and historical character of the Dumbo Historic District. Thank you. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? I'll second it. And Rich, will you call the vote? Yes, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Nay. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with eight in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. Approved. Thank you. And we'll move to the next item. <clears throat> All right, the next item is item number two, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, docket number 20-09034, 611 Second Street in the Park Slope Historic District, block 1077, lot 55, an Italianate style row house designed by Eisenlaw and Carlson and built in 1908. The application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions. And the applicant has joined the hearing. Uh, you now have control of the presentation. Please uh, unmute yourself, state your name for the record, and you may begin. Good morning. Is the applicant with us? Yes, uh, Mr. Lipton, if you could just unmute yourself and just click on the screen to advance the slides. And please state your name for the record and you can begin the presentation. You now? Okay, Mr. Lipton, you're... You're muted. There you yes, go. I'm trying to unmute it. <laughs> uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this application is on 611 Second Street between 8th Avenue and Prospect Park West. Uh, it's in a, a proposed second floor extension above the existing kitchen extension and a penthouse roof extension as well. Uh, the this is uh, the historic district, which you're all familiar with, the Park Slope Historic District, where this black uh, dot is, is our, uh, the uh, project in question. These are the existing uh, rooftop from the rear of the uh, uh, house. As you can see, the uh, project is here and there's an adjacent penthouse uh, directly to the right. On the uh, second floor, which is the extension we we're asking for, there's also an extension to the left uh, adjacent to this property. Here are some existing photos of the existing extension, uh, which we're proposing to build above this extension onto the second level. This is the existing rooftop showing the wall of the existing penthouse directly uh, to our to the left and um, what our, our rooftop looks like. Here you can see a block diagram showing uh, most of the uh, buildings upon this are four story in pink, three story and the existing penthouse uh, here, which we're building directly to the right of that. Uh, that is what the proposal is. This is the front facade of the building, which uh, will not change. Uh, we're not affecting the front facade of the building, showing the height envelope, uh, which we're far below, as you can see on, on the um, model on the right. This is the back of the building showing the extension on the second floor here and the penthouse, uh, the penthouse extension up on top. 
the uh, existing extension uh, on the rooftop is to the right and the existing extension uh, on the second floor is to our left. This model shows the existing building with the rooftop extension uh, to our left that we spoke about and the new proposed uh, addition, which we, we uh, would like to report. This is a similar slide from the rear, showing the existing with the modeling of the existing extension here and the new extensions on the second level, as well as the penthouse. These are, these are the elevations, uh, architectural elevations, showing again the second story extension and the penthouse roof extension. The section shows the uh, person across the street and the sight line, which you'll see in the mock-ups and the, uh, with the uh, penthouse being here, uh, approximately 30 feet back from the front of the building. Again, section, site plan, and some uh, Sanborn maps and block diagrams. These are the plans of uh, the building showing the hatched area as the extension above the existing uh, kitchen extension, which is here. We set back an additional five feet so that we maintain our 30 foot rear yard requirement and the penthouse extension as well uh, uh, shown here. The adjacent uh, penthouse is much closer to the street. We're set back about 30 feet from, from the front facade. This is a, a, a key plan showing the photos that we took, um, showing the, the mock-ups. Here's some photos of the mock-ups that, that were built on the roof. And these are the photos showing that uh, with the mock-up in place, the uh, penthouse roof extension cannot be visible from any thoroughfare, public thoroughfare. This is Second Street looking northwest with the mock-up in place. This is from the corner of Second and Eighth Avenue. This is from the other side on Prospect Park West looking, looking west. And this is from Prospect Park West, uh, again, looking west from the middle of the street. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised, so we'll move to testimony. And if anyone is in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Lisa to walk us through the testimony. Okay, we had one person sign up, uh, Kelly Carroll. And Kelly, I'm bringing you over. Kelly Carroll, Historic Districts Council. Um, I just do want to say I wrote this before the drawings were updated. So I, I was looking at an earlier drawing set, which didn't show all of the visibility. So with that in mind, um, while we believe the rooftop will not be visible, HDC would like to see a more complete application submitted, particularly one with the zoomed visibility studies. This block's donut is nearly pristine and we were not convinced by the next door neighbor's pre-designation rear addition as an adequate precedent to construct one at this location. We ask that the commission evaluate both additions cumulative effect on this block. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, and there was nobody else that signed up to speak. All right, and Rich, did we receive any written testimony? 
Yes, we do have a resolution from Brooklyn Community Board 6 recommending approval. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Lipton, would you like to respond to the comments? Um, no, I, I, I appreciate the comment, but um, this, this edition will, again, not be visible from the public thor thoroughfare. There is existing addition directly to uh, the west of, of the building and um, uh, basically the second floor extension also has the uh, addition to the, to the right of it. So uh, I don't think this will affect the donor whatsoever. Okay, thank you. All right, commissioners, if there are no final questions, we'll move to close the hearing. So I am um, unmuting and requesting to unmute some of you. Uh, all of you at this point so that we can um, close the hearing. Commissioner Chapin, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close the hearing. Okay, and Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? I second that motion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. All right, so um, we have an application here for uh, rooftop and a rear yard addition. So we are looking at the cumulative effect. The applicant has shown similar additions, both in terms of height projection and um, scale on the roof in, within this particular block. Um, so why don't we go ahead and start our discussion? And uh, so Commissioner Bland, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> no, vis no visibility from the public way. Um, everything they're doing in the back, a neighbor has done on either side of them uh, already. Um, I think this is relatively modest into, into what we often approve uh, in, in relation to what we often approve. So I can support it as is. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. I support it. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson. Yep, I agree, appropriate. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, appropriate. Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree. Commissioner Chapin. I agree. Commissioner Goldblum. Yes, I. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna agree. I, I think their their visibility is not the only standard, and and this is a nearly pristine block, uh, with almost no rooftop additions. I would not have supported. It. Commissioner. Devonshire. I think it's a reasonable size addition. I can approve it. And Commissioner Chen. I don't. I, I, yeah, I agree with the commissioners, fellow commissioners. Uh, it's rather modest, and we have approved <laughs> these in the past. Thank you. All right, great. So I think we have a consensus for approval, and um, I'm going to uh, let's see. Com I know Commissioner Bland, you don't have the motion in front of you. So I'm gonna see if Commissioner Devonshire, would you read this motion? Sure. <clears throat> Matter of 611 Second Street in the Park Slope Historic District an application to construct rooftop and rear yard additions. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or conceal any significant historic fabric, that the rooftop addition will be set back from the front and rear facade and will not be visible from any public thoroughfare, that the rear chimneys will maintain their existing height, which matches a consistent pattern seen throughout the row, and only the metal chimney flues will be extended the minimum height required for, by building code. That the one-story rear addition on top of an existing L is in keeping with the height of similar two-story rear additions seen throughout the block. That the rear addition will be set back from the rear edge of the existing rear extension will be clad with brick to match the existing facade and will not be visible from any public thoroughfares. That the cumulative effect of the rooftop and rear additions will not overwhelm the row house. And the work will not diminish the special architectural or historic character of the Park Slope Historic District. And Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? I will second it. Okay. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen, who is back? Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. 
Commissioner Goldblum. I think Commissioner Goldblum, are you? No. No. Okay. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with nine in favor and one opposed, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. So that's approved, and we'll move to the next item. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The next item is item number three, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number 21 01324, 600 Broadway in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, block 511, lot 16. A uh, store building designed by Samuel A. Warner and built in 1883 to 84. The application is to modify storefront infill and install signage. Uh, commissioners, the applicants have joined the hearing. Um, please unmute yourself and uh, you may begin. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Yes. Good morning. I'm Julie Rosen from Higgins Quays Barth and Partners. Oops. 600, excuse me, sorry. It's a, going a little fast. There we go. Um, 600 Broadway is a six story store and loft building that runs through block from Broadway to Crosby Street, just south of Houston in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District. The middle image shows the Broadway facade, which is the primary facade and contains the retail entry at the ground floor. And the right image is of the Crosby Street facade, which contains service functions at the ground floor. Target has leased the ground floor retail space and will be undertaking repair and restoration work at both Broadway and Crosby Street, as well as introducing signage at Broadway and a bay of new infill on Crosby Street. The full scope of work is shown on this slide so that you can see what the entire project entails, but there are only two specific items that require commission level review. There's an illuminated sign at the retail entrance store transom on Broadway, which you can see in the upper right, and the installation of an additional service door on Crosby at the lower right. Here we have just a couple of existing photos of the Broadway retail frontage with a detailed view of the historic sign band where new signage meeting staff level rules will be installed. And a couple of existing photos of the Broadway retail entry doors and transom where the illuminated bullseye sign will be installed. Just a couple of additional photos showing the Crosby Street service frontage, which contains historic metal shutters and vault light steps, both of which will be repaired and restored. At the left is a detailed photo of the southernmost bay, which will become a new service door. The existing infill and bulkhead grill are not historic. The historic cast iron sill shown in the center photo will be salvaged and incorporated into the new door design. The photo at right shows the existing metal shutters and the new service door will match this historic paneling. Retailers in Soho historically advertise their goods with a variety of signage types. This photo from 1890 shows the bracket and panel signs that were historically on 600 Broadway. And this 1937 view looking down Broadway from Houston reinforces the amount of signage historically on the thoroughfare, as well as the importance of visible signage. 600 Broadway is at the near left with the wall advertisement. As early as the 1930s, there was a clear distinction between the primary Broadway facade with its design facade and variety of signage, which you can see on the right, and the building's simpler rear facade on Crosby Street at left. This distinction between primary and secondary facades remains today. Within the last several years, LPC has approved a variety of illuminated signs along Broadway. A selection of past approvals are shown here. Service doors are a unique typology within the Soho Cast Iron Historic District and buildings in the district feature a variety of door designs and proportions. It's also common for buildings to contain more than one service entry, especially on the rear facades of buildings that run through block from Broadway. Here are four examples on Crosby Street alone. Here's a quick summary of the proposed scope of work on Broadway and an existing view at left and proposed rendering on the right, which shows the new signage on Broadway, applied signage at the sign band and illuminated signage at the entrance transom. The signage scope is modestly scaled in comparison to the size of the building, and it is consistent with other signage previously approved by LPC. 
The building is also at the busy intersection of Broadway and Houston as, and is an appropriate location for lit signage. Another view shows the proposed bullseye sign in the transom, which is discreet and located directly above the main entrance for wayfinding. The signage is shown here in context. In getting into some of the details of the signage, uh, the bullseye will be internally illuminated and a two foot six inches in diameter covers only a small portion of the transom window, especially when you consider that the center of the bullseye is open. The sign will be mounted on metal tubes, which will conceal the conduit, and they'll be painted black to match the storefront infill. The tubes will then be attached to the wood storefront infill so that no cast iron is penetrated. Moving on to Crosby Street, here's a quick summary of the scope and an existing view on the left with proposed rendering on the right. The new service door will be installed at the southernmost bay at the location of an existing display window. The new doors will have a panel design that matches the historic metal shutters, and all other work that you see in this rendering, including the restoration of the existing stairs, will be approved at staff level. The existing service door at the north end of the building is specifically used for the office floors above. In order to provide dedicated loading access for the retail space, the new service door is proposed for the southernmost bay, and it will be installed in the same plane as the existing display window. In order to provide sufficient clearance for loading, the new door will be eight feet tall. This is necessarily taller than the existing service doors, which have a very low height of only six foot nine and a half inches. But the design of the new doors will be paneled metal so that there is consistency in the treatment of the service doors throughout the facade. The presence of two service doors, the difference in height, and the design are all in keeping with precedence throughout the historic district. Here's an enlarged view of the proposed service entry and existing versus proposed bay elevations. The existing wood window frame will remain in place and it will just be modified to accommodate the installation of the new doors. The bulkhead, which is composed of non-historic infill and a non-historic grill will be removed. And to prevent the loss of any historic fabric, the existing cast iron sill will be salvaged and relocated to serve as a lintel above the new doors. Here we just have some plan details for the new paneled metal service doors and a couple of existing and proposed sections as well so you can better see the detailing and the changes we're proposing. And an overall summary of the proposed scope of work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Commissioners, do we have any questions? Commissioner Jefferson, please go ahead. All right. Commissioner Jefferson, you're muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, you you say there's um the, you have a precedent for having a symmetrical facade with two service doors that are different proportions. And where is that? Did I miss it? I can go back to the the precedent slide. So there's there's a combination of conditions within the district. Um, let's see. Sorry, there we go. So kind of collectively throughout the district, you see a combination. So on this slide, you can see multiple service doors within a facade in different proportions. And then this was the slide um, showing a couple of, well, four really Crosby Street examples that have multiple service doors. True. To, to go back to your proposition. Uh, 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 the elevation, you're drawing elevation again? Oh, the elevation, sure. Yeah, of, of your proposition. Uh, oh, so the two doors, one on the right hand side is, is smaller than the one on the left hand side, is that correct? Yeah, okay. Right. Correct, yes. The, the service door on the right hand side is the existing historic door. It's only six foot nine and a half inches tall, which does not provide enough clearance for, for loading. Um, so we're proposing a, an eight foot high door um, that does mimic the detailing of the historic doors. So, so help me, how do, you, how do you deal with handicap on this? On I'm this? sorry? 
How do you deal with the handicap going up the stairs? Is, that's not part of this at all? Or that's what? not part of this application, no. And and the, the entrance on Broadway is at grade. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? All right, it appears we don't have any qu other questions for this moment. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa to walk us through the public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand. Okay, we had one person sign up. Um, he has his name, hand up, uh, Pete Davies. If you could just, um, yes. there you go, unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and um, if you choose, and just please state your name for the record. Okay, very good. Um, my name is Pete Davies, Broadway Residents Coalition in Soho. Uh, I stand by the Community Board 2 resolution to ask you to deny the internally illuminated signage, the bullseye on Broadway. Um, the signage precedents that are shown on page 10, if you'd like to look at that, um, none of those that exist now are internally illuminated. The Michael Kors sign is gone. That store has changed. That sign is no longer internally illuminated. 611 Broadway is pin lettering backlit. The 441 Broadway G-Star is, uh, illuminated lettering. It is not a internally illuminated sign. And 483 Broadway for TJ Maxx was proposed to be eternally illuminated, but the commission rejected that. And that is uh, lit in other ways. So there are no precedents for internally illuminated exterior signs. We have been working very hard over the years to restrict such inappropriate signage on Broadway. The one answer would be for them to, if they insist on a illuminated bullseye, that could be done internally, set back appropriately from the window, but to put that on the exterior in somewhat clumsy manner that it's shown with the various supports is uh, both without precedent and um, inappropriate for the district. So we ask that the commissioners deny this aspect of the application. Thank you very much. Lisa, are you muted? Sorry, I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, and Rich, do we have any written testimony? The only other uh, testimony we received was from the community board. Okay, all right. Julie, would you like to respond to the testimony? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, I just need to um, move up to the proposal. I'd just like to reiterate that the, the proposed illuminated bullseye is extremely discreet. It's, it's very modestly scaled, um, fits very well within the, the transom over the entry. Um, and it is very important for helping to identify the entrance to the storefront. Um, and we do think it's in keeping with the, the precedents that have already been set in the district. Okay, okay thank you. And um, maybe Caroline or Mark, um, under the rules for staff level approval, the staff can approve a small neon sign in a window, display window or transom. Is that correct if it's less than 25% of the area? That's correct. Okay, so I think in some ways this is along those same lines. Okay, so um, if, are there any other final questions, commissioners? All right, so I'm going to start to request to, that you unmute yourself so that we can make a motion to close the hearing. All right, so please look at your screen so you can accept that. And Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? I make a motion to close the hearing. Thank you. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Holford-Smith, would you like to start on this one? 
Sure. Um, I'm going to start with Crosby Street. Um, I think removing that um, added stair tower will be an improvement to the Crosby Street elevation. Um, so I'm supportive of that. And I, I think that the asymmetrical new uh, sort of loading dock is, is appropriate for Crosby Street. I know Crosby Street has, um, has a very varied um, uh, group of facades. And I think that, that given the, the width of the building that you won't really, uh, it, won't, it won't strike you as being an asymmetrical, um, as, that, as that being an anom anomaly. So I think that's acceptable. Um, I think that this, the signage, uh, the sign band on Broadway is fine. Um, I'm, I'm not so concerned so much about the illumination of the sign above the door as the, the large tubes that are gonna be um, holding it in place, which I think um, they, they're not shown in the rendering, they're only shown in the elevation. And I think they will be um, more noticeable than is depicted here. And so I'm, I'm just wondering if perhaps it was put behind the glass that might bring the, the bullet forward and the, if maybe the aluminum uh, tubes could be behind that, you would be more layered and you wouldn't see it as well. Mm -hmm. And it might, it might diffuse a little bit of the light. Right. And then it might actually but, be very consistent with a neon sign behind the yeah. window. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Commissioner. Uh, Sarah, if yes. I can just jump in this, Mark, uh, I just want to correct uh, what I said. It's actually a 15% and not 25% for neon signs and transoms for a staff okay. level approval, just so it's clear. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin. Uh, I agree with uh, Commissioner Holford Smith. Uh, I think that most of the changes that are being made are appropriate. Um, I think that uh, perhaps just finding a better way to light, as uh, was suggested by testimony as well, finding a better way to light the uh, logo, uh, you know, on the uh, transom would solve the problem and uh, still permit them to have an illumination. Uh, so with that change, I think I could support it, uh, support all the changes that are being made. Commissioner Goldblum. I agree with Ann. Commissioner Devonshire. I agree with Ann as well. Okay. Commissioner Chen. E3. I agree with Ann as well. Commissioner Bland. E4. Okay. Mm. Commissioner Jefferson. I agree with Ann as well. Okay. And Commissioner Gustafson. Um, I, I agree with Ann, but I also want to uh, um, point out that you know we are frequently bombarded with applications from uh, national and international brands that are um, uncompromising and inflexible and insensitive in their approach to our historic buildings uh, and strong arguments made to do everything the way they always do it. And so, um, you know, this is an exemplar for them, which is to say, you know, this is not the way Target would be doing its branding if it was in suburbia. Um, they've adjusted the sizes, et cetera, the frequency of the signage to to um, to the historic district. And so um, I think that should be commended as well. I agree. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I agree with that and can approve it as presented. Okay, thanks. All right. So I think um, the general consensus is to um, support it with the recommendation that Commissioner Holford Smith has made. So I'll ask Commissioner Holford Smith to make that motion. Sure. Uh, in the matter of LPC-21-01324, 600 Broadway in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District, a store building designed by Samuel A. Warner and built in 1883-84. The application is to modify storefront infill and install signage. I note that the building's style, scale, materials, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of Soho Cast Iron Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the work will not eliminate any significant architectural features, that the proposed modifications to the storefront infill at the Crosby Street mm -hmm. facade, including, the, including removing the bulkhead and modern grill, raising the cast iron sill, and installing new metal paneled service doors 
will be consistent with similar historic and modified storefronts at buildings within the historic district. And the character of Crosby Street as a service street for through block buildings fronting on Broadway supports the presence of multiple service space at the ground floor. That the enlarged service door opening is in keeping with the variety of service infill found at buildings of this type, style, and age, which did not always align with adjacent storefront infill. The, that the decorative cast iron sill will be salvaged and reinstalled as a transom bar, thereby maintaining a significant architectural feature and minimizing the loss of historic fabric. Uh, that the proposed illuminated signage is well proportioned to the transom and will not call undue attention to itself, uh, and that the cumulative amount of signage will not overwhelm this through block building, and that the work will not detract from the special architectural or historic character of the building of the Soho Kessar Historic District. However, I find that the illuminated sign located on the outside of the building with prominent uh, metal framing um, will be inappropriate and that the applicant should work with staff to find an alternative way to provide an illuminated sign, perhaps on the interior of the glass. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Se second. Okay. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. We'll move to the next item. The next item is item number four, application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number 19-39827, 85 Christopher Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, block 619, lot 81. An apartment building with stores designed by W.J. Gessner and built in 1872, the application is to replace windows. Uh, commissioners, you'll note that the applicants have joined the hearing um, and staff will be presenting the proposal with the applicants available for questions after. Great, thank you. And I also wanna note that um, we'll be hearing from Dina Posner, who is one of our preservationists who has been on staff for a while, but this is her very first public hearing. So she is starting her um, training in uh, doing remote hearings. So we welcome her and welcome this presentation. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, good morning, commissioners. I'm Dina Posner uh, for the preservation staff and I will be presenting this application for 85 Christopher Street. And um, the applicants are also present to answer any questions um, at the end of the presentation. Um, let's see. The application is to replace the front facade windows at floors two through six with aluminum clad wood windows. The proposed windows will comply with staff level rules except for the proposed metal material. If the building was one story higher or a little bit wider, the aluminum clad windows would be permitted at staff level. And the building is part of a row of four buildings as shown on the, in the context photo on the right. The existing windows are modern aluminum replacements and were installed without a permit. These photos show probes of the aluminum with the aluminum panning pulled back, showing the deteriorated and missing underlying wood elements. And these are more photos of those probes. These photos show the existing aluminum windows. The other three properties in this row currently have two over two double hung windows, which matches the historic configuration. Two of the buildings have wood windows and one has aluminum windows that were installed without a permit. This slide shows up some of the other neighbors along Christopher Street, showing that there is a variety of building types and window configurations along this block. The Historic photos here show this row of four buildings and the historic configuration of two over two windows at the upper floors.
The proposed front building elevation shows the new windows proposed to match the historic configuration and operation. This slide is only meant to show the proposed brown color, not any details or profiles. These are the existing and proposed window, window elevations showing the new configuration. And this slide and the next show the existing and proposed window sections. The section drawings have some detail and drafting inaccuracies. The applicants have confirmed that they will continue to work with commission staff to resolve these. However, as I previously noted, the metal clad wood windows will not comply with the staff level rules because of their material. That completes the presentation. And again, the applicant is also present to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, do we have any questions? All right, Dina, I think the presentation was very clear and explained a lot, and that may be why we have no questions at this time. So let's move. Thank to, so thank you for that. And we'll move to testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand. And I'll turn it over to Lisa now. Okay, we didn't have anybody sign up for this item. And I do not see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. Rich, do we have any written testimony? We do have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board to recommending denial of the application. Okay, all right. Um, let's see if the applicant would like to add any um, anything. If you're, uh, yes, I'm, thank you, hi. Please state your name before you speak and then if you'd like to add anything or uh, speak to the Community Board's comments, that would be great. I'm Steven Skabora, I'm with PVE Engineering, and I think Dina covered everything, uh, everything that, that we wanted to go over, so no further. Okay. Do you wanna speak a little bit about the community board? The community board seemed to be kind of split down the middle about the, the decision to approve. They They thought it was commendable that we were, you know, restoring the original configuration, but they were torn over, you know, whether aluminum clad wood or just original wood was the most appropriate okay. solution. All right, and and I understand from Dina's presentation that you, if approved, you would continue to work with the staff on the details and profiles. Yes, that's correct. We, uh, so the, the original shape and configuration is so, it's pretty simple and so, you know, we think we would be able to match it, I don't, you know, okay. pretty close. Great, thank you. All right, commissioners, do we have any final questions? Okay, not seeing any, we'll move to close the hearing and um, Commissioner Gustafson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Moved. Commissioner Shamir Barron, would you second that motion? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The hearing is closed. Um, and so this is um, an application for a building which is, um, a, I think, a build, a, apartment building <coughs> doors um, built in 1872. And it's sort of borderline. If it were a little bit taller or a little bit wider, it would meet the size requirements that under the rules that allow the staff to approve a change in material. And so that's why it's before <coughs> us today in addition to um, working out some details. And um, it, in this case, they are restoring the original configuration. So the, <coughs> the question before us today is really about this, the material and the finished material of that. So Commissioner Goldblum, would you like to start on this one? Sure, I, I don't have any um, significant objections to it. I think it's appropriate. I think, uh, Use of the alternate material is something we've approved before. The <coughs> details of such windows are good. And uh, I'm glad that they'll work with staff to work on the details. Commissioner Devonshire. Um, I, I <coughs> am okay with the uh, return to the sash configuration. I am uh, mildly troubled that the um, details for the for the window surrounds, the casing surrounds, which would have been and actually were shown in the photographs, were a, were a flat with a, a bead and quirk 
which is a, a typical surround for New York City windows of this era, I want to be sure that they are working with staff to uh, replicate that as well, not just the squared off sheet metal pan. Yes, agreed. Okay, Commissioner Chen. I, I'm fine. Okay, Commissioner Bland. Uh, I'm fine with it as, uh, as long as they're working with staff to get the final details co correct. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Um, I'm fine with it. The details are important. So working with staff, is, okay. I can approve it. All right, Commissioner Gustafson. Um, appropriate, I agree with my fellow commissioners. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Agree. Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree with uh, Commissioner Devonshire that the, the panning should not be done in aluminum, but it should be the uh, replicate the original wood uh, brick mold that was there. It's still there, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that is that what Commissioner Devonshire? Is that what you said? I thought you just meant to make sure you got the bead correct in the. Aluminum. No, the, the the brick mold I think has to replicate the original wood, and it looked like in okay. in a couple of those photographs the wood is still there. Typically, what happens is that that casing molding rots, the brick mold rots from the bottom up. So the bottom right. six inches is gone. Um, but there's plenty of detail left so that they can replicate that uh, if they if they are required to in metal. Okay. All right. So I think, um, I just want to make sure I've, I've got this right. So uh, Commissioner Goldblum, I think you were comfortable with the aluminum clad wood as the material we've approved in the past, correct? As long as the details were match the historic details. Correct. Correct, okay. And Commissioner Bland, I think, was that your position also? Yes. All right, and Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I agree with Commissioner. Okay, and Commissioner Jefferson, I think you were fine with that as well. Yes. And now Commissioner Gustafson, when, when you said agree, I just wanna make sure I knew which position you were agreeing. <laughs> I'm not even sure that there are two different positions here. I agree with Commissioner Goldblum. Okay. And Commissioner Shamir Barron, which would be yes. allowing aluminum clad wood yes. just with the right profile. Okay. Correct. And Commissioner Chapin. Yes, I agree with the majority of the commissioners as stated. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So I think we have. Um, while not unanimous, we have the votes for approval with modifications for the aluminum clad windows with panning as long as they continue to work with the staff on the replicating the bead and the profile. So, Sarah, sure. you, yes, you, you can see that detail in the lower right mm -hmm. uh, image. Yes, four brick, four bricks up from the sill. You can see that flat, and then the cork and the and the bead on the interior side. Yeah, yeah, the bead is a very typical, yeah, detail. Yeah, you can also see the ghost, interestingly, where the uh, shutter <laughs> pintle plate was attached to the brick mold there, too. Interesting. It is interesting. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum, would you make that motion? Sure. Regarding 85 Christopher Street in the Greenwich Village Historic District, the applications to replace the windows. I note that the building's scale materials um, and details are among the features that contribute to the special architecture and historic character of the Greenwich Village Historic District. And I recommend approval, finding that the proposed work will not eliminate or damage any significant architectural features oops, um, of the building, that the proposed two over two uh, double hung uh, windows will match the historic windows in terms of operation, configuration, and finish, that the change in material of the windows from wood to metal will be imperceptible as seen above the commercial ground floor and will not detract from the special architectural historic character of the building or historic district. The applicant has agreed to work with staff to refine the details, especially the uh, brick mold and other details as discussed in this hearing. Thank you. Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. And Rich, let's call the vote and see where we are. Okay. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Gustafson. 
Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion carries. That is approved with those modifications. Please work closely with the staff on that. And we'll move to the next item. The next item is item number five, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, docket number uh, 21-01311, 29th Avenue in the Gansport Market Historic District, block 628, lot one, an arts and crafts style warehouse building designed by Lafarge, Morris, and Cullen, built in 1913 and altered in 1953. The application is to install signage. Applicants have joined the hearing. Uh, you may begin. Great. Thank you. It's Cass Stackelberg with Higgins, Quays, Barth, and Partners. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. And I'm joined by Brandon Padron of uh, Lucid Motors, our, our client, and the project architect, uh, Christos Natanas uh, from Marble Radzinger Architects. I'm going to run through the presentation, run through the presentation, and um, uh, with some comments from Brandon, and we'll be happy to share um, share any uh, or answer any questions you may have about the presentation. Um, uh, as described, the project addresses at 2 9th Avenue, uh, located here in the Gansvort Market Historic District. Uh, it's a six-story warehouse building, uh, seen on the far right. Um, the center, you can see uh, it's just at the edge of the district, uh, just to the south of the Gansford Hotel with frontages on 9th Avenue and on Little West 12th Street. Um, the, the site uh, is to be a showroom or gallery for Lucid Motors, an exciting project for uh, an automotive company, um, which is focused on the production of electric vehicles. And uh, Brandon will mention a few um, comments about that, but I do wanna just mention the proposal is for uh, signage attached to the canopy uh, above the two entries on 9th Avenue and on Little West 12th Street. Uh, Brandon, you wanna step in and uh, say a few words? Yeah, uh, very quickly, just to introduce ourselves because we're, we're new to the community. Um, Lucid Motors is a luxury electric vehicle um, company that's based in Silicon Valley. And uh, we're opening our first showroom in the New York Metro area at this property. Um, and we're really excited to join the community. And um, yeah, go with us. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the overall summary slide here on the left is an existing view of the building. Uh, on the right is the proposal. Uh, again, the, the proposal is for two signs. Um, these are dimensional letters uh, mounted onto a back panel uh, on the front face of the canopy, um, one here on 9th Avenue and one here on Little West 12th Street. Uh, because of the underlying zoning, uh, this sign is proposed to have a halo illumination uh, but this sign, because it faces into a residential district, uh, will match the detailing, but will not have uh, any of the uh, halo lighting. And I'll show you uh, details in, in just a moment. Um, some existing views of the building, again, a six-story warehouse building uh, constructed in 1913, arts and crafts, a very stripped down uh, building. The canopy itself was actually installed in, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, historically, the building had a small canopy uh, at the main entry uh, down on the north side of the 9th Avenue facade, but this, end, uh, this canopy was added to the building prior to, uh, to designation. Um, it's a simple uh, steel frame canopy with um, corrugated metal uh, decking across the top uh, and just mounted into the front facade, similar to, uh, to other canopies seen uh, elsewhere in the district. Um, looking at the building uh, in uh, these historic views from the 1940s, uh, historically the building um, had signs at the ground floor as well as this larger plaque sign on the corner and dimensional letters, uh, dimensional panel signs uh, on the spandrels on the upper floors. Uh, you can also see here, this is the original canopy at the building entry, which itself had a sign, uh, sign panel mounted uh, onto the, to the side of that, uh, to that original canopy. And of course, the, the district, you all know the Gansborough Market Historic District well. Um, these two photos on the right from the 1930s, on the left from the 1940s, just illustrate the sort of commercial vibrancy of the neighborhood. These are views on 14th Street looking uh, west on the right toward, um, toward the uh, steamship line pier heads that existed along the Hudson River. And of course, the history of the district is tied to uh, the, uh, the markets which existed around it and in the 30s and 40s in particular, um, all of these ground floor uh, entities, these commercial uh, entities 
uh, were in support of the hotel and restaurant trades and the steamship lines along the river. Um, the, the district at that time was, was very active and very vibrant, and the type of signage often used um, at the ground floor was the same type of signage we're proposing. So panel signs with dimensional letters, uh, sometimes on the front edge of the canopies, sometimes on the sides of the canopies. Uh, there's also, of course, painted wall signage, spandrel signage, but uh, much, of the, the, much of the signage was um, installed at the canopy at the ground floor level uh, throughout the district. Um, some detail signs, uh, this on West 13th Street, again, a large panel sign on the side of this canopy uh, on 13th Street on this three-story building. Um, this building, which is diagonally across from the project site on the corner of Greenwich Street and uh, Gansevoort Street, uh, again, panel signs and then some details uh, of some of the signage on, on 14th Street. Um, looking at some of the signage that's been approved by the commission since the district's designation in 2003, um, there, uh, the staff has approved signage on the front edge of canopies, commission approvals for uh, dimensional letters on the canopies, and then also uh, lit signage uh, elsewhere in the district, particularly focused uh, at building entries or store entries. Um, so there's a combination of signage uh, that has been approved, um, similar to what we're proposing uh, in association with entries and canopies. Um, looking at, uh, again, a sort of a rendered view. So this is the Ninth Avenue side. Um, the main entry to the store uh, will be here. Uh, and then the proposal is for, uh, for a sign over that, uh, over that entry. And that sign will be uh, halo lit and then turning the corner um, onto Little West Troll Street. So this in the foreground is what's referred to as Gansevoort Plaza today. Uh, another entry to the store and a separate sign um, over that entry. Uh, looking at this in elevation again, so sort of looking at the scale of the building, the, the scale of the sign, we think aside from it being associated with the entries to the showroom, uh, it is proportional and in scale with this very robust six story, uh, six -story warehouse building. Turning the corner, uh, similarly scaled, uh, signage um, associated with uh, with the main entry. Um, and then some details. Um, the sign panels um, are 15 and a half feet uh, long, two foot three inches tall. The letters themselves are just nine inches uh, in height. Um, and then on the other side, and then some details. So this is a section through uh, the sign on Ninth Avenue, the halo lit sign. The panel itself is about two inches thick. Uh, the letter, uh, which will be a brushed stainless steel, is uh, nine inches tall. Uh, one inch thick and then the, the illumination is set behind the letter so the letter is opaque and there's just a glow behind it. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, attached onto the front edge of the canopy uh, and the canopy is non-historic, it's dating to the, uh, to the 1980s. The detail on the Little West 12th Street side uh, matches the 9th Avenue side but just does not have the electrification uh, for the halo illumination. So at the daytime, these will appear, uh, appear identical. Um, some uh, additional details for the signage. This is a, a night view, sort of a render view. So again, the letters themselves are opaque and there's just a glow uh, behind, uh, behind the letters uh, themselves. And then a detail of the attachment onto the front edge of the canopy. Uh, and then a summary slide again, just illustrating um, the, the overall proposal. Two signs, uh, one with illumination on 9th Avenue, uh, one non-illuminated on Little West 12th Street attached to non-historic infill. And we think in terms of the character of the neighborhood, both in terms of its historic sort of commercial character and also the, the, the character that the district has taken on really um, since designation, since the, uh, about 2000, uh, this is a vibrant commercial neighborhood. Uh, and we think that this sign and, and the store itself and the showroom itself uh, will contribute to the, uh, to the vibrancy of the neighborhood. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, and do we have any questions, commissioners? All right, I don't see any hands raised, so we will now move to testimony. And if you're here in the meeting and would like to speak, please raise your hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Lisa to run through the testimony. Okay, uh, this is an item which nobody signed up to speak. And um, if anybody here wants to speak, please raise your hand, but I don't see any hands raised. Okay, all right. And Rich, do we have any written testimony? We have a resolution from Manhattan Community Board to recommending approval of the application. Okay, great, thank you. All right, any final questions? I think it's a, a fairly straightforward application. Um, so commissioners, I am starting to request to unmute all of you. So look at your, for your screens to accept that. 
and we'll make a motion to close the hearing. Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make that motion? So moved. And Commissioner uh, Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Great, thank you. And so the hearing is now closed and we'll have our discussion. And I think, um, thank you Cass for a very detailed and thoughtful presentation. Um, I think that we've seen lots of um, precedent for signage on can canopies and our rules for staff level approvals allow for hang signs hanging from the canopy, um, but have not yet um, addressed signs being attached to the above the canopy. And that's why that's before us, this is before us today. So um, Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start on this one? Yep, I think this is uh, quite reasonable and approvable. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Uh, totally agree. Commissioner Bland? Yes, I agree. I think the, uh, the horizontal exaggeration, let's say, of the five uh, letters also give, uh, 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 fit well with the horizontal nature of the uh, canopy too. It's a, it's a beautiful sign actually. Okay, Commissioner Gustafson? Yeah, I concur. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Yes, I agree. Commissioner Holford Smith? I agree. Commissioner Chapin? I agree. And Commissioner Goldblum? Agreed. Okay, and Commissioner Devonshire, would you mind reading this one? I know you've read one already. I think you skipped Commissioner Jefferson. Oh, did I? I'm so sorry. Commissioner Jefferson. It's a, it's a very sophisticated sign, and I agree. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay. In the matter of LPC 21013112 2 9th Avenue in the Gansevoort Historic District, <clears throat> uh, application to install signage, I recommend approval. Finding that the placement of the signage on the fascia of the canopy is in keeping with the placement of historic signage sometimes found on buildings of this age and type. That the proposed signage will be simple in design, well proportioned to the canopy, and typical in terms of material and finish. <laughs> that the proposed metal halo lit letters facing Ninth Avenue will not call undue attention to the installation and will be in keeping with the evolved commercial character of this historic district and the cumulative amount of signage will not overwhelm the building or streetscape. Thank you. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second it. Okay. And Rich, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll. Aye. Aye. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Commissioner Shamir Barron, you're on mute. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. And Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Okay, with 10 in favor and unopposed, the motion carries. Okay, that's approved, thank you. Okay, we're, we're going to break for lunch now and we will come back um, in, at one o'clock, we'll begin the afternoon session. So for all of the attendees from the public that are in our meeting, we're gonna ask you to leave the meeting at this time and then rejoin at one o'clock. And uh, commissioners, you just need to turn your cameras and your volume off. And if you could come back at five to one, then we can um, do the setup to ensure that we start right at one o'clock. Okay, thank you all and see you in about 35 minutes. Okay.